Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It's January 25th, 2024, and we are here to discuss part three of our LDS discussion series. Today, we're going to be talking about John C. Bennett, Joseph Smith's right-hand man, and homosexuality um, in Nauvoo, Illinois, uh, you know, during the final years of Joseph Smith's life. Uh, this is part of the LDS discussion series. Uh, if you're this is the first time you've joined us on Mormon Stories or on LDS Discussions, we want to strongly recommend that you pause this, go back to the beginning. This is like the 50th or the 51st episode of LDS Discussions. It's a series where we're trying to discuss, explore Mormon Church truth claims in as neutral and objective and as fact-based of a uh, of a foundation as we can. And these episodes build on each other. So you can go to YouTube, the LDS Discussions playlist. You can go to Spotify. You can go to Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. There should be a LDS Discussions series there. You can start from the very beginning. You can watch it on YouTube. You'll get the best um, experience if you watch it either on Spotify or on YouTube. But you're also very welcome to listen to it on any uh, podcast platform that you prefer. But um, this series is uh, well-loved, and we're so thrilled that it's continuing. We want to welcome back uh, on the show Mike, the father of LDS Discussions. Hey, Mike. Hey, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> uh, Mike Mike has a website called LDSDiscussions.com where he wrote a gazillion amazing essays, and uh, you can read all this research that he did. Mike, it's good to have you back. It's good to be back. Nice to be back with everybody here. So it's fun. Gonna be fun. And uh, the the Robin to Mike's Batman is Nemo. Hey, <laughs> hey Nemo. <laughs> hey, how you doing, John? Welcome back, Nemo the Mormon. Nemo uh, has an amazing YouTube channel that you all should subscribe to and donate to. How you doing, Nemo? I'm all right. I I wanted to suggest before we we start that we introduce a new segment called Snack Time with Nemo. Okay. Um, because the people seem to enjoy my eating of Doritos live on air. Um, and so I think we should every episode bring in some snacks. Um, wait, wait, let's get it. Let's get a close up, Nemo. We got to get a, a, a shot of that for, uh, there you go. we got to get a shot of that for Instagram. All right. All right. We'll freeze that. Uh, thanks, Nemo. We, we appreciate you bringing that waxy chocolate onto the program. Okay. And of course, a new addition to the LDS discussion series is Julia. Hey, Julia. Hi. How's grad school? Um, it's good. There's a lot of uh, reading. <laughs> Julia just started her master's in uh, history at? At Missouri State. Yeah, the, in Zion, basically. Yeah. You're basically yeah. in Zion. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we're in part three of our series with John C. Bennett. He's one of the most important figures in Mormonism that Mormons have never heard of. He was Joseph's right-hand man. Part one, we talked about him being mayor and and uh, chief justice and co-president of the church, chief cook and bottle washer. He was everything in Nauvoo. Um, part two, we talked about abortions and polygamy and spiritual wifery. And part three, it's scandalous, Julie. Are you trying to tell me that there was LGBTQ shenanigans going on uh, in Nauvoo, Illinois? Yes. And actually, D. Michael Quinn, he's one of my favorite historians, and he has a book a 19th century study of same-sex dynam dynamics or something like that. So please go read that one. He's got a lot of information. It seems like the early church leaders did not treat homosexuality in any way like they treat them now. So, yeah, that's a really interesting study to look at. <clears throat> All right. Oh, also, I wanted to make a comment. Um, so last episode, we talked about um, the spiritual wife and things like that. And uh, in William Law's affidavit, he says that um, he heard of abortions and you heard of the no women or women got no issue. How did the phrasing go? Yeah, there's yeah. no issue from the women. So yeah. the word issue, yes, it isn't. There was a lot of commenters. Um, yes, that word means posterity. So I just wanted to throw that out there and clarify that at the beginning. Wait, hang on, so. Julia. Are you are you clarifying a previous statement you made so as to ensure? Well, because I wasn't have sure. The most I, information. Are you, is that well, what you yeah. doing? Of oh, can wow. Mormons can Mormons do that? Wait, yeah. That, well, I'm not a Mormon. <laughs> how excellent. How excellent. I'm an ex-Mormon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good clarification. All right, Julia. Well, uh, today's going to be fascinating. So, uh, yeah, where do you want to start? Yeah. So um, there's a quote actually from D. Michael Quinn from this from this book that I was referencing, the 19th century uh, dynamics, same sex dynamics. Are we okay, starting with that? Uh, yeah. So there's the quote right after this slide. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, 
Okay, so yeah, the first topic is homosexuality. And he says, the, this is from D. Michael Quinn. The first known instance of homoerotic behavior in Mormon history involved John C. Bennett. That and we I know of, was, yeah, yeah. Yep. That we know of, that, that's yeah. on the historical record. And yeah. I just think that was cool because I I was excommunicated for being queer, uh, for leaving my temple marriage and uh, pursuing a same-sex relationship. Anyway, so I just thought that was really interesting that we can, there's a person, Mormonism so new that we can figure out What's the first instance? I don't know. I just thought that was. No, that's, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> and, yeah. and if John C. Bennett was excommunicated, it wasn't for that. I could tell you that. Yep. Nope. <laughs> and right. that's one of the things we're talking about too. So. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Okay. In honor of Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to read the slide? Yes. Bennett do you want to give your, do you want to give our British listeners a warning, like a content warning, Nemo? <laughs> yeah, a content warning for those. We are about to use the B word. Um, okay. <laughs> actually, Is that a pretty, swear word? It's pretty mild over here, too. Oh, though. okay. I was like, I would never have put that up. I, I heard it was worse than the F word. Is that not true? No, 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 no. Okay. No, no All right. I mean, no offense. This is what the historical record says. I would, I would yeah. say that as a... Like it's it's edgy, but I'd say it as a like a as a fully orthodox member. All the all the Americans are thinking, why is bitch a bad word? I didn't even know that was such a bad word. <laughs> yeah. yeah, ready. <laughs> um, Bennett accused of buggery in the Wasp, published on July twenty seventh, eighteen forty two. It reads, "It will be seen by this that General Smith was a great philanthropist as long as Bennett could practice adultery, fornication, and we were going to say buggery without being exposed." Buggery was a slang word and legal term for sodomy. And is that still is that still a term that's used in in Great Britain? Oh yeah. So like, if something goes wrong, you're like, oh bugger me, and then you actually think about it, and you're like, that's really an inappropriate thing to say when you think about <laughs> what you're actually inviting upon yourself. Um, but it's it's seen as much less you cheeky bugger. That's a yeah. It's but it means it means same sex word. same sex intercourse. Is that what it means? If you think about it, yeah, but. In the same way, the f bomb means sexual intercourse. People don't drop that Got thinking it. of that; it just becomes <laughs> yeah. a word, right? That's Got so it. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. What do you want to say about that, Julia? <clears throat> um. So yeah, this was before. I think this was right before his excommunication, around that same time. And so they're pointing out in the newspapers that he was accused, or he is being accused of of homosexual relationships. And then, like you said, John, that was not among his list of reasons why he was excommunicated. So okay. Yeah. All right. So because we know he was practicing, quote, spiritual wifery, that would probably make him bisexual, is it maybe? Well, that's what I think. And that's I think that's what Quinn points out, too, is that this would be a form of, like, bisexuality. Okay. But he was so close to Joseph, that's interesting. Maybe we'll get to that. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so then there's another case where Joseph oh. Smith was accused of buggery. Um, okay. Mike, do you want to read this one? All right. So this is from also from The Wasp, and this is Orson Pratt. Um, is um, he seems to accuse Joseph Smith of immoral acts with another man. And so Joseph Smith says, question to Elder Pratt, have you personally a knowledge of any immoral act in me towards the female sex or in any other way? Answer by Elder Orson Pratt, personally towards the female sex, I have not. Historian Mike, uh, D. Michael Quinn clarified that since the same issue of the wasp had already raised the topic of Bennett's buggery and the prophet's alleged toleration of it, Smith's or in any other way was an implicit challenge for Pratt to charge him with buggery as well. Pratt declined to answer whether Joseph Smith had committed any immoral act with someone other than a woman, but also declined to exonerate the prophet from such a charge. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I thought that was super interesting. Wait, did you have a comment? Nima? I was going to say, if I understood that correctly and he's saying like, so have you seen me be sexually immoral with women or indeed with anyone as if to say like, you know, with men as well. And basically, Pratt's like, well, not with women. Not with a woman, yeah. And we're pointing out that the illusion of the failure to charge him with men as well is interesting. Is that is So that putting our skeptic hats on, uh, what do we think? I mean, who, who not... are we to question Michael Quinn, right? But <laughs> what do y'all think? Well, it's not you... much to go on. So there's there's really not a lot there because he just says, personally, towards the female sex, I have not. So it's, it's very little, but like, I like the Quinn's like, it, it might be enough. To, to say that Joseph Smith was also engaging Could in this. Could it also be Pratt's sensibilities that he couldn't even bring himself to conscience <laughs> the idea of homosexuality and so doesn't want to... Do you, know, to do say you that? get what I'm saying? Yeah, to say it. Like to, he wants to censor yeah. himself, which which yeah. if that's the case, even the Wasp was kind of censoring. Like they, oh, we were going to say buggery. And then yeah. later they, we'll see that some of the stories were changed. Mm -hmm. um, 
so maybe it's the sensibilities of that so yeah maybe yeah. maybe Just yeah it's it's weird because it reads like if i if i were to read that right now without any of that context from michael quinn i might think that orson pratt might be going like i have no idea what you're doing with other people but with the, with regards to females i haven't seen it so I, you could go so many different ways. So I guess for me, it's kind of like one of those things where it's so open ended. It's almost like you could draw your own conclusion based on kind of where you want to go with it. But it is it's it's an interesting quote for sure. It's just hard for me to like make sense of it. And I don't know if that's um, something where we could find like the longer uh, records of if that's from like a disciplinary court or something where you could see if there's any context around it. Maybe there's immoral acts as far as like financial fraud or, you know, stuff like that. I, I, I just don't know. You know, it, it kind of feels like maybe that's drawing too much out of it, but it's certainly interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's good. I think we always, <clears throat> there's this thing, presentism, right? Where we assume the same cultural mores and values then that we have now it's very possible that like same-sex sexual relations in the late 20th century was viewed more severely than it was in the 1840s by mormon church leaders right mm -hmm. that it could have been seen as less of a big deal than like what spence w kimball wants to make it which is like a, a, a an abomination right mm -hmm. it, it could have been just viewed as like oh you shouldn't do that i don't know do you know julia yeah. Oh, I don't know. During the stance, during the time, no. I should read Quinn's book again, though, to see if he has any insights on that. Okay. And what's interesting yeah. on, on that point, John, is that what a lot of apologists like to say is, oh, you know, standards, would when they talk about marriage, say, another sexual interaction between people, they like to say, oh, standards were different then. You know, people were getting married younger. So yeah. that would actually then play into that argument. If they want to say that standards were different back then, that's fair. And that presentism argument is fair. But then we have to look at the implications of that. Got it. Yeah, with homosexuality. So, yeah. All right. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So then on one occasion, so this is Bennett with Higby. On one occasion, Joseph Smith discovered Francis Higby with John C. Bennett on a bed on the floor, engaging in activity, quote, so revolting, corrupt, and disgusting that the editor of the Times and Seasons censored the material from readers. The censored article from the Times and Seasons says, I wanted to testify to this court. So I guess it is a court record. Like you said, Mike. I wanted to testify to this court of what occurred a long time before John C. Bennett left his, this city. I was called on to visit Francis M. Higby. I went and found him on the bed on the floor. Here follows testimony, which is too indelicate for the public eye or ear. And we would hear remark that so revolting, corrupt, and disgusting has been the conduct of most of this clique um, that we feel to dread having anything to do with the publication of the trials. We will not hereafter, we will not, however, offend the public eye or ear with a repetition of the foulness of their crimes anymore. Well, there, there goes my theory that it may not have been viewed as a, yeah. as a significant or severe thing, right? They're calling it foul, uh, foul. dread. <laughs> I mean. But at the same time, you have Joseph who doesn't excommunicate him for this at all. Like, so well, revolting, corrupt and disgusting. Right. That's, that's pretty extreme. I, why, what are the court proceedings? I think that's interesting. What, who, yeah. Who's on trial here? I don't know. I have to. I have to read the whole full thing. This I just pulled from Quinn's book, so I'd have to read the whole thing to get context. But it is 1844 that this is yeah, this, being published. This is the time it kind of feels like um, quite a bit. Yeah. Nemo, see if you can sleuth this out because if 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 if, uh, if this is like a trial for John C. Bennett, because he like you know, let's just say John C. Bennett defied the prophet, made the prophet look bad, accused the prophet of uh, polygamy, which he was denying, then the, le let's just say they were trying to smear him in this court. And so they charged him with something that everyone would be viewing as disgusting. Mm -hmm. Then that could just be a smear campaign. Now, of course, I'm just speculating. But I mean, certainly Joseph Smith and those around him wouldn't be uh, above smearing someone with lies, right? Nope. No. Yeah, yeah. So to discredit, to, so to, to discredit um, John C. Bennett's testimony against Joseph, they're trying to smear uh, okay. Bennett. That's what you're saying. Um, so or, or just that's as, a, as a figure. Yeah. It was the municipal court uh, of the city of Nauvoo, third day of the return before Alderman N. K. Whitney, acting Chief Justice, and Alderman Daniel H. Wells, William Marks, Orson Spencer, George W. Harris, Gustavius Hills, George A. Smith, and Samuel Bennett, Associate Justice presiding. Um, ex parte Joseph Smith Sr. on habeas corpus 
against Messrs. Siles and Rigdon, who are the counsel for Smith. Oh. Huh. Case came before the port upon a return to writ of habeas corpus, which was issued by this court on the 6th of May. Uh, instant upon petitioner Joseph Smith. I'm not sure what any of this means. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not either. It, just, okay. it feels like there was that, Lawyers, there's that joke. Could... It's not a joke, but it's like, um, I think it was John Larson when I was listening to the old Mormon Expressions episodes when I first started listening to stuff. He would say it was always kind of like this this like joke that whenever someone accused Joseph Smith of something, he would then accuse them of that. So like when he proposed to Nancy Rigdon and she rejected it and it got exposed and he accused her of kind of being a whore you know, through the newspapers. And in this case, it almost makes me wonder if, if John C. Bennett has all this expose coming out and now Joseph Smith is trying to get out ahead of it and saying, hey, I saw this, I saw that. It's not to say it didn't or didn't well, this happen. Is two years it after. feels like that. Or this, this is two is... years after... This is so after Bennett yeah, his, got booted out, right? Yeah, so his expose was published at the, near the end of 42, and this is okay. beginning mid of 44, yeah. so Yeah, so I just wonder if that's like, if this is a continual response to all of these charges that are going out. And I think Bennett is actively doing those like talks and lectures about this stuff, right? So I just wonder. Yeah, that's what. Mm-hmm. So it just feels like this could be one of those things where Joseph Smith's like, oh, I just thought of something that I saw <laughs> because there's no, as far as I could, I mean, I, I don't know if there's a contemporary disciplinary court record of it but if there's not it feels very interesting that you'd bring this up you know and i also wonder is um because i can't remember if francis higby was still with the church at this point or not i'm assuming no oh that's a good I'm point i'm not too. sure because that would be a really easy one to just go after it's kind of like when we talked about um the the three witnesses and how they all got booted out of uh the church and then as soon as they got booted out joseph smith rewrites a lot of the history because they're not there to say anything you know so i have you know it's just interesting i don't know the timeline of that but I would need to find that, you know, look at that. Well, what does this mean to you, Julia? Um, yeah, uh, I guess it's just further evidence. Um, although, you know, like we're saying, it's kind of questionable evidence. It does seem likely, based on all the evidence, that John C. Bennett is a homosexual and he has relationships after Mormonism that um, there's no reason. I don't know. Like, Joseph's trying to smear him, I guess. Um, so I don't know one way or another whether to believe this or not. Um, yeah. I mean, it... It certainly falls for me within the realm of credibility. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, and again, his closeness to Joseph Smith, you have to watch part one of the series. They are so close that there it's, I think we renamed the episode Joseph Smith's Navu puppet because John C. Bennett was clearly Joseph's right hand man. So it's, it's impossible to not at least wonder, right. Make that association. Mm-hmm. Okay. It is so- interesting though. Yeah, Nemo, did you, have, did you find anything? Yeah, yeah. So I've just done a little bit of reading, and basically it seems like the the circumstances of this court case are actually Joseph Smith Sr. is... Um, Who passed away. Because he passed yeah. away in 42. Or, yeah, so I, or I wonder whether this is... Um, because the undersigned is Joseph Smith Sr., Navu, May 6th. So I wonder whether, at this point, because Joseph Smith's father's passed away and Joseph Smith has a son called Joseph Smith at this point... The third, yeah. Is he now going by Joseph Smith Sr.? Oh, Joseph Smith Jr.? That's a good question. Oh, yeah. Is interesting. he now going we by don't, Joseph Smith Sr.? We clearly um, don't know what we're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> so if that's the case, then this would be Joseph Smith. Um, he was on trial and under arrest within the city of Illinois at this time uh, within oh, the custody oh. of John D. Parker, um, the deputy sheriff. And basically, Francis M. Higsby, uh, or Higby, was char- was going after him for damages of five thousand dollars? Yep. Oh, okay. That's, there that's you go. That's what this court case is about. So he's trying. So he's not. He's not trying to put Bennett under the under the bus. He's trying to throw Higby. Put under Higby the bus. under the bus. Yeah, that and it's easy sense. to do because John C. Bennett's already an, an enemy, right? And so, just as a quick timeline, uh, it says on June thirtieth, eighteen forty-two, Higby gave a sworn statement that Joseph Smith told him that John C. Bennett could easily could be easily put aside or drowned, and no person would be the wiser for it. Um, On January 15th of 1844, the Nauvoo Municipal Court issued a warrant for Higby's arrest on the affidavit of Orson Pratt. So that kind of maybe shows why Orson Pratt's involved there. Um, It says that Higby was present at a meeting of dissenters on April 28th. On May 1st, uh, Higby filed that legal complaint. Uh, This article is from uh, May 15th. And then on May 18th, he was excommunicated from the church. So definitely seems like he's going after Higby here. Maybe he's using Bennett. Because Bennett's already kind of a, an enemy of the church, and it would be well. And he'd already been accused of buggery, so why? Yeah, wouldn't they exactly. Do that? So it, you know, but 
that's it definitely shows that there we go. these things don't seem to have come up early and all of a sudden you know they, they come up with these these reasons and it doesn't mean it's not true it just means that it's awfully convenient sometimes when joseph smith pulls these things out as justifications for what he's doing or for what he's doing to others mm-hmm. yeah we'll have to talk about those characters when we talk about the leaders of the church and the early church who left or were excommunicated we'll have to okay. add higby and pratt it'll be a future episode yeah, yeah. all right julia what's next Okay, so there was a sermon by Brigham Young that also alludes to this um, homosexuality of of John C. Bennett. Um, John, do you want to read this one? Sure. Sermon by Brigham Young. On May 15th, 1844, Brigham Young gave a sermon published in the same times and seasons. Quote, I will make one statement in our conversation with Dr. Bennett. I told Dr. Bennett that one charge was seducing women and leading young men into difficulty, he admitted it. If he let young men and women alone, it would have been better for him. In this same sermon, Brigham was specifically referring to 21-year-old Francis M. Higby. That's Times and Seasons, 15 May, 1844, page 539. Now, can you talk us through that, Julia? Because I'm not totally understanding what Brigham Young is saying there. So it sounds like he's bringing up, you know, he's bringing up Francis again. So he's also of the opinion that Francis, he's believing this homosexuality between Bennett and Higby. And so what what I'm gathering, and this could be something different, but because of the Higby reference, it makes me think that he is talking about homosexual relationships. But he's saying that Bennett was leading, he was, it, to me it reads, Bennett was seducing women and seducing men and leading them into difficulty. That's what I'm gathering from that. Do you guys have other thoughts? The Certainly thought that, that came way. to my mind immediately, just because um, maybe I'm a Brit and we do innuendo and and that sort of thing, um, it could also be, was he ever trying to get the young men to engage in spiritual wifery? That's, that's, yeah, that's a, and See, that's another one. thing you can point out with the difficulty, because yeah. he was trying to convince others. Yeah, Leading those young men into difficulty by trying to teach them that principle that was getting them yep. in trouble. Yeah. 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 And, so, and that we know happened because... Well, we we don't know for sure that he was accused of teaching other people because they all said that it came from Joseph Smith. But you have that kind of that ring of like Joseph Smith's brother, Bennett. I think there's like two other men. So you could make the argument that Brigham Young here is saying that Dr. Bennett was the ringleader teaching these younger men spiritual wifery, which led them into difficulty. So, yeah, that, that's another maybe more plausible. Can, can I note something that's weird to me? Mm-hmm. Sure. Why Why is Brigham Young only concerned if it's young men and women? Why is he okay if it's not young? He throws young in there as if Higby or Bennett were doing this with just mature young, mature men and women. No harm, no foul. Am I misreading that? Uh, I'm having to avoid the pun. Go on, Julia. Oh, no. Well, that's what he's saying. He's saying young, uh, which again, he's ex- he's taking young women into polygamy. Joseph Smith certainly was. I don't know the ages of, yeah. of uh, Brigham's wife, so I don't know. I don't know. Well, there, there's yeah. the hypocrisy of the fact that yeah. Joseph Ann Brigham married teen, young teenage girls, but there's also the implication that if they're not young, no harm, no foul. At least that's how I'm reading it. Yeah, it can yeah. be read that way. So there's a lot of different ways to take this. So okay. Yeah, right. well, maybe it's like, like if he'd left the young women. Yeah, if he'd left the young men and women for us, then we wouldn't have bothered. Oh with him man, just that's, dark. On, right? that's dark. Right? Yeah. That's dark. Yeah. That's dark. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. That's good. This is good. Let's keep going. Okay, so Mike, you've referenced this one before. I've heard you, I think you even quoted in our last episode. Do you want to go ahead and read this one? Yeah, so this is the uh, idea that Joseph Smith teaches that sin is not sin. And so this is on the 7th of November, 1841. And Joseph Smith says, if you do not accuse each other, God will not accuse you. If you have no accuser, you will enter heaven. And if you will follow the revelations and instructions with God, which God gives you through me, I will take you into heaven as my backload. If you will not accuse me, I will not accuse you. If you will throw a cloak of charity over my sins, I will over yours. For charity charity covereth a multitude of sins. What many people call sin is not sin. And um, yeah, this was a no huge one the happiness letter because this is Joseph Smith telling everybody, hey guys, if you don't accuse me of anything, I am going to leave you alone. And it really shows that this is how he operates it's, as well. So It's like the judge not lest ye be judged thing has been taken yeah. to then go, so if you don't judge me, I won't judge you, and then we'll all just be fine. It's what? sort of a anything goes. Yeah. It's it's literally like anything goes in Nauvoo as long as we don't uh, accuse each other of anything. Except how how really can it not be? Joseph Smith. 
How is that not what it's saying there? Anything goes. But then that's this what is it, where... Yeah. Julia, Sorry, Julia, go Julia. Go Julia. No, no, I was going to agree with you. That's exactly what it sounds like it's saying. And this is also 1841. So this is before Bennett. And so like, I'm, it's curious. Yeah. I'm curious to know what Joseph was trying to maybe say or mm -hmm. cover up for. I, or I, I could tell you. So this is right around the time that polygamy is about to ramp up, right? And go mm -hmm. back to that slide real quick. This, this is the line right here. Go back to the slide. Um, and if you will follow the revelations and instructions which God gives you through me. That's oh, basically man. saying if Joseph Smith tells you to do something and you do it, you cannot be a sinner if you don't accuse me of doing it. I mean, like that is, it's not about, it's not saying to the whole church, hey, um, Nemo, if you want to go uh, sleep with a bunch of young women and you guys don't accuse each other, it's okay because it has to be through Joseph Smith. So there still is that structure going down. Ridiculous. And this is basically, to me, we did this on the happiness. This is basically Joseph Smith putting out there, hey, if I tell you to do something and you do it, you can't sin. That, that's So that's, you you didn't finish the sentence. It's the happiness letter episode on LDS discussions. Yeah. And uh, everyone go back and watch that, especially if you haven't, because it's certainly one of the most important moments in Joseph Smith's history is the Nancy yeah. Rigdon uh, happiness letter yeah, and as a quick note, this will tie into the last episode a little bit because there are some people that are saying Joseph Smith didn't write the happiness letter. And you read this this quote here, which is not disputed. This is basically the theme of the happiness letter, which is what might seem wrong in some circumstances is right. You know, and so this is basically Joseph Smith laying down the foundation of, yeah, I'm going to tell you to do things that you think are horrible, but they're absolutely cool because they're through me. You know, they're through God, you know, because of me. So it, it really is... Um, this is one of the most important quotes you'll have because it really illustrates how Joseph Smith is able to flip uh, morality upside down by saying, hey, if you just do what God wants you to do, which I can only tell you, then then you're cool. It, it's also a threat, right? If you will not accuse yeah. me, I will not accuse oh, you. Mm -hmm. So it's like I'm coming after you. It's sort of this yeah. mafioso, if you accuse me of anything, you're toast, right? Yeah. Am I am I am I overreading that? That's what I'm seeing no. there. That's what I'm That's seeing what too. It is. And, and and we know and we know that he smeared any woman that denied his polygamous advances that then spoke out about it publicly. Yeah. He would yeah. slut shame them. Am I wrong, Julia? No, that's very correct. Yeah. It's factual, it. right? Mm, yeah. He would call yeah. them horrors. He would call them horrible humans, right? Well, he did the, he did that with Nancy Rigdon when she when she rejects his advance, he called her a woman about the town and these sorts of things, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, wow. He's is... he's literally giving us the pages from his playbook. He's yeah. saying the quiet parts out loud. Because I think yeah, he's I mean, getting to the point where he can, right? You know, he's getting more yeah. and more powerful. He can kind of just be quite brazen about this stuff. But also the cat's getting out of the bag and he's got to mm -hmm. develop a way to deal with the cat. Yeah. Get, cat's getting out of the bag. <laughs> well, yeah. Because right? this is where it's say, really about is... to ramp up. This is like oh, um, this is like the justification for soaking in many ways. It's like if we don't move, it's not a sin. It is still a sin, and it's the same thing as like if you don't grasp me up, if you don't accuse me of anything, then it's not a sin. It's like we don't have these conditions of like if X, then it's not a sin. God's pretty like firm about these things. He doesn't want you to do, uh, and Joseph Smith knows that, but he's having to come up with these external justifications right. for well, if yeah. X Y conditions are met, i.e., I've told you to do it and you don't say anything about it then it's fine. But just like we all know the argument for soaking is ridiculous, this argument is also ridiculous. Well, I still don't think soaking is real, but but uh, well, okay. I will, will note that, I know, but the point is, uh, to, to what you're saying is, you know, if, if you're with someone in, in your BYU and you're like, hey, let's soak, if we don't tell anyone, there's no sin, Joseph Smith said it, but that's why that line is so important because he's saying through me. So that's like the ultimate you know, trump card on everyone else, which is to say that John C. Bennett can take those exact teachings and go to a woman and say, hey, let's have sex because it's not a sin if you don't accuse me and I don't accuse you. But then Joseph Smith can jump in and say, hey, I did not tell you guys to do that. And that's that's yeah. really where he's he's once again asserting himself over everybody else and he is inserting himself as the moral compass of everybody else as well. Yeah. He's also saying buggery isn't a sin, right? Homosexuality isn't a sin if there's no if accuser, do right? It, if he tells yeah. you to do it. And I think that's what I found yeah. interesting about this slide is because Joseph never accused. He was never on trial for that. That's not why he was excommunicated. So, like, I think even Quinn pulls out this quote to say that maybe Joseph didn't really care or that he didn't mind that, jo that Bennett was engaging in these things. Well, because I, I would think that Joseph Smith is like, at this point, if, if you're the guy that 
if we take a position that God didn't tell Joseph to practice polygamy, if you, if you take that position, and this is a creation of Joseph's mind, then Joseph is clearly sexually experimental, right? He's willing to try different ways of having sex with people uh, under different uh, arrangements and whatnot. So he is likely to be quite sexually liberal, I would imagine. And so maybe he personally doesn't mind, particularly, as long as no one's accusing anyone of anything. Yeah. 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 All right, Julia, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so then I wanted to talk about there was um, this idea of why Sodom was destroyed. And so we're, I'm just going to work through this slide and we can talk. Um, we can, you know, comment whenever you want to. Um, so Mormonism's founding prophet also revised the common interpretation that God destroyed Sodom because its inhabitants preferred sex between men. And again, a lot of these are from Quinn, from his same-sex dynamics. Wilfred Woodruff's journal gives us Joseph's revision, recorded on January 22nd of 1843. Second, sec, 22nd Sunday, President Joseph Smith delivered an interesting discourse at the temple to a large congregation. In consequence of rejecting the gospel of Jesus Christ and the prophets whom God hath sent, the judgments of God hath rested upon people, upon people, cities and nations in various ages of the world, which was the case with the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, who were destroyed for rejecting the prophets. And then if also, if you look in Ezekiel, in the Bible itself, it, it puts away this idea that they were destroyed because of same-sex relationships. In Ezekiel 16, 49, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And the Bible and Bible scholars agree that Sodom was destroyed because they were not hospitable to strangers, not for same sex, not for sex between men. And, and John, your episode with um, Dan McClellan, he also brings this up. He's a Bible scholar, and he also says that this is not the reason why that Sodom was destroyed because they weren't hospitable or they weren't good hosts, not because anything to do with um, same-sex relationships. Right. But equally, not because they failed to follow the prophets either, but Joseph yeah. Smith's going... Well, it, that's one way of then essentially putting terror on people, being like, look, entire cities have yep. been destroyed because people didn't listen to people like me, so you better listen. True, yeah. very true. This is the anyway, most self-serving also... quote you're going to see. Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, I just thought it was also interesting that he's he's reframing the common idea of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so again, this makes me think that um, Joseph probably didn't care. You know, he's sexually experimenting. And I don't think he had, I don't think he had a negative opinions and from what it looks like it doesn't seem like he had it as big of a deal he saw it as a as big of a deal okay got it yeah. okay what else uh, okay next slide okay so yeah so this one um quinn pulls this one out as well he th there's a lot of debate with in the in the early christianity or early mormonism is that people had this victorian love for each other they would they were just like, women would hold hands, women would kiss, like even men would kiss. I'm, even a lot of the prophets kiss each other um, in the past. And so it's hard to know what is homosexuality and what is is like this Victorian love. I don't know how else to explain it. Um, Nemo, do you want to read this, the quote itself? Sure. Yeah. Joseph Smith once said, to bring it to the understanding, it, meaning the resurrection, would be upon the same principles, though two who were very friends indeed should lie down upon the same bed at night, locked in each other's embrace, talking of their love, and should awake in the morning together, they could immediately renew their conversation of love, even while rising from their bed. Yeah, and that's from hmm. Wilfred Woodruff's journal. <laughs> Did you guys have thoughts on that? Uh, it, it's... It doesn't make a lot of sense. So he just kind of yeah. read it again. Talk, talk us through it, Julia. Talk yeah, us so, through it. So yeah. he's te he's teaching a sermon about the resurrection, and he's like, it would be mm -hmm. just the same. Like we we don't need to be worried. I think he's saying like we don't need to be afraid of of death and resurrection. It would be on the same principles as if two of you were to, two friends were to lie down together on the same bed, locked in each other's embrace, and he's talking about two men, and they should wake together and renew their conversation of love. So like in my head, and maybe this is presentism. Um, in my head, it seems like there's no straight, there's no <laughs> straight way to explain this. Um, but again, this could be the Victorianism. It, it's yeah. an unnecessary detail, right? Yeah. Because if you if you if he wants to explain this simply, he just says it's like going to bed and then waking up the next day and everything being as normal. That's that's right. what he's trying to say, right? There's no need for this sort of homoerotic detail of being locked in the embrace of someone you love on the same bed and yeah, everything bed, like that. Yeah, it's. 
It's just a bit odd. I find it a bit odd. I don't know what it says because, like you said, the problem is there's so much euphemism and innuendo in so much of this. I think we, I've said made this point before, but it makes it very difficult to know um, because the whole point of euphemism and innuendo is to hide your true meaning sometimes. Right. I wonder what point Joseph was trying to make there. Well, yeah, like like okay. I said, it's basically just that the resurrection is quick and is like going to yeah. sleep and waking up again. But which he could have said in so many different ways. Yeah. Right. yeah. How do, yeah. How, okay, maybe I'm being conf confused here, but how does this quote imply that it's two men as opposed to just two people that were just talking? Is it because well, we're so saying friends as opposed to like marriage or lovers or whatever? Um. So I pulled this out of Quinn's. Yeah, that's a good point because he doesn't specifically say in this block. Um. But I yeah. should look up and see if he does specify because Quinn made it seem like. It was two men. So maybe I just didn't get okay. enough of the quote, but y'all have to look at that. Look at that. I mean, we, we should acknowledge, and we probably already said this, that, that Michael Quinn, the, the super well-known uh, Mormon historian who was picked, you know, Yale PhD, picked by Leonard Arrington to be an assistant church historian during those Camelot years of, uh, quote, transparent Mormon history at church headquarters in the 70s. He himself was gay. He was in a mixed orientation marriage. I should add, there's a brand new book coming out um, by Signature Books called Chosen Path, which is Michael Quinn's memoir. He passed away, I believe it was last year, but it was pretty recently. And so I think what my, obviously, <clears throat> what's that? Oh, was it, was, was it, it, was it five yeah. years ago? Yeah, time goes by way too fast. It anyway, might, I might be wrong. Don't quote me. No, I'm sure you're right. Um, anyway, it's clear that he, he was looking for, uh, issues around homosexuality because of his own personal story and, and, and background and interest. So, you know, we can just acknowledge that, that, that he's, he's, he's affected by his bias in these quotes he's picking. Right. Yeah. He could be yeah. seeing things that maybe they don't mean. And I think he points that out really well. No, you were right. It was April of 2021. Um, but yeah, you're, you're right that he could be trying to find things that aren't there but I think he's forward about that. I think he's saying like, there's really not a lot to go on, but this can be seen this yeah, way or not. It's at least, it's at least good to know about it. Right. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then, so then, so that's, there's really not a whole lot now that I'm looking at all this, there's really not a whole lot to go off of Bennett being homosexual. I think there's enough, especially I guess what happens after that's my biggest convincing thing is hit the events that happen after Mormonism. Um, but so now, are we are we done with the homosexuality topic or does it keep going? Well, in the it, slides? It, it trickles in a little bit, but yeah, that's, okay. that was the bulk of it. Just in his Mormon. In his okay. Mormonism. So what so are this, we transitioning to? Just what happened to him? The fate? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. this is like from when he leaves, from when he leaves Nauvoo and then what happens on. And then we do have, we do have, I want to talk about um, what happens to him after Mormonism because I still feel like it weighs like patterns, um, like future patterns can also reflect on yeah happened. yeah and and leave, leave for those who didn't or don't remember or didn't watch the past episodes where did we leave off with john c bennett okay so in the last episode we talked about how he was um there was a lot of he was accusing joseph smith of spiritual wifery and he was being accused or excuse me was he i don't know the la the language of polygamy spiritual wifery and everything like that confuses me so he, he was, was accusing joseph Right. So he was accusing Joseph of being with women and he was being accused of being with women. And he was also we, we brought in uh, abortions, too, and how that was maybe how Joseph was keeping this quiet um, and things like that. And then in the beginning, we talked about how close he was with Joseph and all the roles that he that you'd mentioned and then how he was quickly excommunicated because all this stuff was coming out. And so um, and then we talked about how um, Bennett tells the story of Joseph Smith pulling a gun on him unless he were to sign this affidavit saying that. Um, the spiritual wifery wasn't anything to do about Joseph. Um, I don't think the gun story is, I, I don't believe the gun story part, but him signing the document makes sense to me. Um, and then, so this is where we're going to pick up. It's like right after he leaves Nauvoo. Okay. So he's been excommunicated and he's basically being run out of town. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. His autobiographer or his, excuse me, his biographer doesn't seem to think he's like, there was, maybe we talked about this before. He says he leaves Nauvoo really quickly because like he was thanked publicly as the mayor. He kind of hung around for a little while, but then all of a sudden he just leaves. And so I'm not exactly sure what prompted that. And I don't even know that the, his biographer knows, but so that's where we're going to pick up is his quick leaving. And, and just sort of like a PR expert would want it to, to minimize the public scandal, but then to make him disappear as possible as soon as the public scandal was diffused. Is that fair to yeah. say? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. So let's jump back to the slide. What happened to John C. Bennett? 
Okay, so on June 21st of 1842, Bennett abruptly left Nauvoo and headed for Springfield. Bennett claimed that on the way there, he was followed by Mr. O.P. Rockwell, a Danite, who, who on his arrival late at night made strict inquiries as to where I was. His ostensible business was, was to put a letter in the post office, but judge ye the real reason. I was prepared for the gentleman, and he approached me not. But another swift rider, Captain John D. Parker, another Danite, followed me to Springfield to carry a letter to Dr. Helm. But he had another object, and you will, and you may well suppose what it was. <laughs> Sorry. I told Captain Parker that I was aware of his object, but I feared him not. <laughs> in Virginia, in Cass County, on my return, Parker met me again, and, and I called attention to the stage driver to him, who, thereupon, put two additional balls into his pistol, and then informed me he was ready for him or any other person having the same object in view. All right, so tell us who the day nights are. We, did we cover that, Mike, in, uh, in our LDS discussions episode so far? Because that's, that's, that's one of the top 50 issues that bothers people about Mormon history, right, Mike? Yeah, we we brought him up throughout, like, but not in a in a real like comprehensive way. So I think we mentioned him when it kind of fit in, but we didn't do anything like okay. individually. We on should them. definitely do that one. So Julia, tell us tell us just briefly who the Danites are. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, so outside of Bennett's, I they're kind of new to me as well. But so it's these group of people that work. So historians will debate on where where they extended, but in Kirtland, um, this I think it started in Kirtland. Um, please correct me if that's maybe Missouri. I think, yeah, I think it was in Ohio, I think. Ohio? I think it was. Okay. And so he Joseph gathered a lot of these men, and he had them— so some of this might be incorrect because some of this is coming from Bennett. He had them swear an oath, and, and one of the, some of the other sources, not Bennett, say that there was at least 300 of these Danites that swore their allegiance to Joseph Smith as the leader and that they would do whatever was needed to be done. And a lot of times what that involved was usually violence, um, from what my understanding is. So they were— sort of like the bouncers for Mormonism. I don't know how, does anyone have a better description than that? They would threaten, they would intimidate, yeah, and if uh, necessary, they, be they willing did. to do violence to- Mormon enforcers. To protect like, Joseph they, Smith. They, right? Yeah, they started in Missouri, I'm wrong, because in Missouri is where they had the Hans Mill and all that, right? So that's oh, yeah. was kind of happening at the same time. So yeah, there was kind of like a, almost like a special ops force of Mormonism that was willing to do things other um, people wouldn't, maybe. Porter Rockwell I, is the most well-known one of them. Yeah. Uh, right. yeah, I definitely associate them with, with uh, Missouri. Yeah, they were definitely yeah. Missouri. And just a, a quick point about them, or, or about the individuals involved in this story that we've just looked at, is that John D. Parker, uh, in that court proceeding we were looking at earlier, was the deputy sheriff in Hancock uh, County, um, and was the one whose custody Joseph Smith was in during these court proceedings. So Joseph Smith was in the custody of a Danite. That's really interesting. So that shows you how, like, within Illinois itself, so much of the church was controlling everything that was going on, and the loyalty to Joseph yeah. was ultimate. Like, he was in custody, but to someone yeah. who had sworn an oath that they would protect him, so. That's yeah. super and interesting. That was, well, that was a big part of the whole issue, like, you know, when they talk about why the mob attacked Joseph Smith and killed him, it's, you know, um, I forgot what it was, it was one of the historians um, like John, maybe John Hamer or someone, someone, they were saying like it, a lot of it had to do with the fact that these these people just were like he is constantly surrounding himself with people that are just going to support what he needs to do, and so um, that's why habeas corpus becomes this big deal, and, and because they know if he if they can't get him out of Nauvoo, he will never pay for any crimes he commits because they're basically it's all fixed, and so that is a big un, part of the unrest towards Joseph Smith is that he's created this power structure that he is one hundred percent in charge of. Yeah. Okay, so let's take it back to the slide, Julia. Yeah, so he's just telling the story that he's been, he's leaving Nauvoo and he's saying um, these two men are following him and he's ready for them. And he's, um, I think it's funny that he's, he's both men are like, oh no, I'm just going to mail, mail this letter. I'm not going to kill you. Um, but he's like, I know that you are. And so he's just, he's kind of making himself the hero and um, like this persecution of, I don't know, it was just funny the way that Bennett says it to me, um, but also like it wouldn't surprise me at all if this were to have actually happened because of yeah. what later. And the yeah. parts that we know touch on reality is that Oren Porter Rockwell, you know, was, you know, is likely the person that attempted the assassination on Governor uh, Boggs of Missouri. He, he bragged about doing violence for Joseph Smith. So, I mean, whether or not this happened with John C. Bennett, that checks out with what we know about Oren Porter Rockwell. 
and just him mentioning the Danites and feeling fear of violence, that checks out in terms of just what we know about both Missouri and Nauvoo and Joseph surrounding himself with uh, protectors willing to do that, violence, right? Is Oren Porter Rockwell the one that um, Joseph promised if he didn't, he gave him like a Samson promise, like if he, he blessed him, if he didn't cut his hair, he would be, no man would be able to defeat mm. him. I, I that could be rock, true. I thought that was Rockwell. I've heard this. Yeah. yeah. But you can Google no, it, no, Nemo. You can always Google those things. Oh, no. Well, we can let the audience tell us in the comments. That's more fun. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, so whether or not Bennett's lying here, this definitely squares with what we know about church history, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so in his book, so this is more about the Danites. In his book, John C. Bennett claims that the Mormon Danites were called the Daughters of Zion and gave word for word the supposed oath, and again, we don't. I don't know for sure, <laughs> taken by the secret band. And so this is the oath. Actually, Mike, do you want to read the oath? Yeah, so this is um, the supposed oath taken by the daughters of Zion, which is the Danites, and it says, In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I do solemnly obligate myself to myself ever to regard the prophet and the first presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints as the supreme God, that I will stand by my brethren in danger or difficulty and will uphold the presidency, right or wrong, and that I will ever conceal and never reveal the secret purpose of the society called Daughter of Zion. Should I ever do the same, I hold my life as the forfeiture in a cauldron of boiling oil. Oh, man. Can I just highlight a couple things there? Yeah, please. So, like, the first presidency of the church and the prophet are the supreme God? That's just horrendous. Uh, basically pledging allegiance to m very flawed men as, as divinity? That's outrageous if it's true. We know that Joseph Smith had himself, by the end, uh, ordained as king of the world. So, I mean, we know Joseph's not beyond uh, sort of extreme worship and a adoration. So, I mean, this fits at least that. But Supreme God takes it to 11, as, as the movie uh, Spinal Tap says. But then also uphold the presidency right or wrong. That squares with Dallin H. Oaks's comment, you know, in the past 30, 40 years that it's wrong to criticize the brethren, even if the criticism is accurate. We know that Dallin Oaks has said that in modern times, so it doesn't seem, oh, oh, and we also have the Mormon temple ceremony oath to never speak ill of the Lord's anointed. And since the church admits that cheat leaders make mistakes, that means you uphold the the church leadership right or wrong. I mean, right? I've never heard of Daughters of Zion as another name for the Danites, so that's new to me, but I, I'm rusty on church history. And then this idea of like forfeiting your life, I mean, that squares that's with my temple ceremony oath to slit my own throat or have my heart cut out of my chest or to be disemboweled if I ever uh, violated my temple covenant. So that idea of swearing violent death upon yourself absolutely squares with the Mormonism that I, that I know of, mm -hmm. right? Whether this is actually true. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I just, I, that, no, that slide good. triggered me, Julia. Just to yeah. add to your Dan Lake jokes bit, Henry Biaring <laughs> did say, uh, it is a, th it is a sin we must repent of daily to think, to even think of weaknesses in those that we have pledged to sustain, meaning the first presidency and quorum of the 12. Said wow. That um, Wait, which session? That's insane. Uh, I can get you a citation for that. Okay, perfect. That's yeah. that's crazy. Yeah. But also, this like this made me think too. of my own temple experience. Where one thing that really bothered me in the temple is that we don't covenant. Uh, there is a there's a there's a specific covenant where you covenant to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, like your very lives if necessary. And that always bothered me because why aren't we covenanting our lives to Jesus or God? Like why is it to the Church? And here in this slide, you like it says the first presidency as the supreme God. They're not covenanting to God. They're covenanting to the first presidency. So anyway, that was- And they would just say there. they are the mouthpiece of God and Jesus. So they would say, whether by my voice, meaning Jesus, or the voice of my servants, the first presidency, it is the same. And that's yeah. Mormon doctrine, that, that the first presidency speaks for Jesus, for and in behalf of God and Jesus. My last two videos have been all about the conflation between church leaders and Jesus Christ and how they demand the same loyalty that you would give to Jesus. Uh, a citation for that quote from Henry B. Eyring, it's his talk, The Power of Sustaining Faith from the April 2019 General Conference. Okay. No. Dang. 
So I would just, okay. I would just the only thing I'll note on this is that this slide and the last one, they both feel like he has John Bennett has this this insider knowledge, and it does feel like he's weaving it through what he knows. I'm not saying that this is false, but there's no other attribution of this anywhere. At least I'm doing a quick Google search. I've never heard of it before. It just makes me wonder if he knew like some of the temple ceremony stuff, and then all of a sudden he's like, okay, I can kind of work this into something else because it, it's possible, it's true, but in it. It tracks, like you've said, a lot of this stuff tracks with the things that are being said at the time, which makes it really hard to know. Um, it's just also one of those things where it almost feels too good to be true. Like it feels almost too much like someone's writing this to make it seem like the church, like Joseph Smith is just crazy with power. Although, you know, they also say Joseph Smith mm -hmm. wasn't necessarily running the Danites. So it, it's just, it's really messy. But yeah, it's, it tracks in a lot of ways. Nemo. Um, I just, I think a real good way of summing that up is to say it's almost like impressionist art. A lot of what John C. Bennett's like impressionist art it gives you the feeling, the flavor is there. This very much feels like early Mormonism, but the exact details, probably not. And and Mike, I think it's really important you're reminding us in this episode, like we tried to remind people in the past too, that John C. Bennett is not always a reliable narrator. And in some instances, he's completely unreliable. So everything John C. Bennett says, everyone should always take with a grain of salt mm -hmm. and, and form their own conclusions. But but he was a scoundrel. Flat oh, yeah. out, he was a scoundrel. So we and need to always there. remember that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, no, I, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I don't think the Daughters of Zion is a real thing. I think it's something that he's just making up. Um, I, I bring it up because it's really interesting. And also the oath is meant the main thing that I wanted to talk about. But then also he, he goes on with his stories of the Danites. And then I and I do have some questions with the for Mormon historians, but we can talk about that in in a few slides. So what were you okay. going to say? Yeah, and the, and one, one small thing I'll add here is this is one little reason why I think there is reason to want to be skeptical of the happiness letter because that's coming from John C. Ben. And it, even though we're told that's a letter he has that really isn't disputed as far as, you know, um, Sidney Reagan and Nancy Reagan don't come, out, don't come out and say the letter is completely made up. So that's why. And the teachings are good and it's very long. Um, but, you know, this is why, because he does have an insider knowledge and he's really good at embellishing. Like in that last slide where he's like, I knew they had a gun on him, but I wasn't afraid. It's like, shut up, dude. Yes, you were. Like, come on. No one's going to you're not going to see some dude come up that you think might kill you with a gun in their pocket and just be like, yeah, I was cool as a cucumber. I mean, come on. So. That's yeah, I, I really like that there. you point out. Yeah, I really like that you pointed out even the last episode where you're like, Bennett is really, he's really out there with his stories. So why is the happiness letter so almost subtle in what it's saying? Yeah. It doesn't read like Bennett's writing it. It does. And it, like, and, and, and that's the thing. Like, so to, to follow up on, on that, like one of the complaints is that he writes it and the, the, the counter to that is why if he was writing it, look at this mm -hmm. oath, look at the happiness letter. If he was writing the happiness letter, I would guarantee, I would bet money that John C. Bennett would have something like in there. It is permissible for you to have sex with me as a concubine or some language that's so loaded that it would be the most damaging. Whereas the happiness letter, if you read it on its own and you're not really thinking of the context, it doesn't read as manipulative and controlling as it is. And that's why, you know, to what Julia is saying, it doesn't even feel like it's written by the same person because that one is very subtle. It's very symbolic. It's very um, understated. Whereas John C. Bennett in his expose is trying to hammer that Joseph Smith is an evil person. And so they don't, that's why it doesn't match to me, but he's it also is book. why, yeah, he's trying to sell a book. And so that's why there is to me, I can understand why people are skeptical because this stuff to me reads as somebody who is trying to embellish what he knows into something that's absolutely scandalous. So you should, you should apply that same skepticism everywhere. I try to say that. And so I need to do that. Um, and we all need to do that with the happiness letter as well. Although we, we did do that in that episode and tried to address that as well. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Nice y'all. Yeah. So this next story so that you'll see there's a gentleman here on the visuals. There's a gentleman here in a dress. And so this next slide will clear up the, why that, why that's there. All right. Okay. So this is in, this is from the Sangamo journal. Bennett recounted, this is from the Sangamo journal, Jul July 22nd of 1842. Bennett recounted that Smith had threatened to kill him and had ordered some of the Danite band to effect the murder clandestinely. According to Bennett, on the evening of, Ju of June 29th, 12 of the Danites dressed in female apparel, approaching my boarding house, and this is General Robinson's that he was staying at, in Nauvoo, and their carriage wheels wrapped with blankets and their horses' feet covered with cloth to prevent noise. About 10 o'clock, and this is in the evening, for the purpose of conveying me off and assassinating me, thus prevent disclosures. But I, so admir but I was so admirably prepared with arms, as were also my friends, 
that after prowling around the house for some time, they retired. I'm still not understanding why there's a man in a dress there, though. So he's so they're dressed in women's apparel. So I think oh. that's why they're called. Oh, dressed. It's right there. Dressed in female apparel. Right. So what's so, going on there, Julia? Tell us what you think is going so on there. I think Bennett's just. I don't. I think it's just blowing smoke. But he's saying that that these Danites were called the daughters of Zion, and they would dress in women's clothing, and they even they came. They were trying to be really secretive. They wrapped blankets on the horses' feet and on the wagons because it was too loud. I don't know why they couldn't just walk because Nauvoo, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, and then he said that they were going to kill him, but they were. But he was really prepared, and the people he was living with were really prepared that they just went away after a while. So It, it yeah. really gives me, that bit where he's like being so admirably prepared really gives me like, it came to pass that I, Nephi, being exceedingly young, nevertheless being large in stature. It's like, <laughs> I, Nephi, being a big dude was like all good. It's it's giving me those same vibes as like Ben. It's like, but I was just so well prepared; they couldn't come near me. It's like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, I think just... Nima, you'd. I think you mentioned in the last one that like I like there's enough in Mormonism that he didn't have to make stuff up. Yeah, yeah like exactly. a... he didn't have yeah, to have yeah. them in dresses. It it's very likely that Joseph could have sent some Danites to try and off him. Like that is possible. But yeah, the details of them being dressed as women. Why does that make a difference? Maybe he thinks that because he's been accused of being such a ragamuffin and sleeping with so many women that people would, for some reason, expect a load of women to turn up at his house in the middle of the night. And that was the ruse. Well, I let's be clear. It could have happened. We don't know. Oh, we yeah, don't know. We don't yes. know. Yeah. We're speculating. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like Mike it's said, like I don't a... think the daughter's design exists anywhere else outside of Bennett's book. I don't, okay. I don't no. think any historian will. Which seems to be a reference that. to the whole. It's, it's almost like he's created this narrative that the daughters of Zion uh, are some sort of. It's the way that the Danites clandestinely assassinate people dressed as women to hide their tracks. Which yeah. Which, which makes no sense. It's is odd. Okay. This reminds All right, me so... of. Uh, I was just Go gonna, I was just gonna say this reminds me of the movie Home Alone, <laughs> and, and Bennett's inside getting all his crap together, and they got the women outside, and they're just too afraid because they think there's this party going on. It's it to me it's silly, but yeah, I mean we don't know, but it just doesn't it doesn't make sense. It's strange if credulity. Gonna, if you're gonna kill someone and you don't want to draw attention, you're not gonna send a send a bunch of dudes dressed as women to a house that's gonna draw attention. It just makes no sense. But okay, you know. all right, okay, yeah. But the, but that's what Bennett claimed. Yeah, yes. Bennett claimed. Yes. Yeah. Claimed. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so this is from Fawn Brody, and I do have a little bit of pushback. So, But this is in her book um, of No Man Knows My History. She claims, she says, there is no reliable evidence that the day and night organization was continued in Illinois, except among Joseph's personal bodyguards. So again, like we talked about with Orrin Porter Rockwell. White uniforms, not robes, as Bennett described in his book, were part of the military attire. So she's saying he's even getting the, the costumes wrong. John D. Lee, one of Joseph's bodyguards, proudly wore his red sash in later years and when he went to when when he went to dances in southern Utah, so I she's mean, it explains a lot. Got yeah, so she's sorry. saying like there's no evidence that the Danites ex existed past. She said in, into Illinois. I don't know whether they would have moved on from Missouri. I don't know that specifically, but so she's saying every to me it reads like John C. Bennett's none of this is real because the Danites weren't a thing anymore. Although if you're, she did say that they would exist as Joseph's bodyguard. But also my thoughts are if they're really taking an oath for for their whole life to to see Joseph as the supreme god, why would that go away? Yeah. Like in Nauvoo. Like if you've made a covenant, it persists. I, anyway, so I have questions about that. But well, yeah, like once a Danite, always a Danite, right? And right, like, right. I would, I would think that maybe what Form Brody is, is saying is that there's no evidence of them being acting as an organized group anymore. But I would, yeah. all those individual members exist. Like those people, a lot right. of those people survived. To, and their oaths uh, were for. Their oaths were until their death. So it's well, not exactly. like they ever renounced their mm -hmm. oaths, their day night yeah. oaths, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, yeah. several of the Danites, as I understand it, well, let's just say several of the perpetrators of the Mountain Meadows Massacre mm -hmm. were associated with Joseph Smith in either Missouri or uh, Illinois as Danites or protectors, including John D. Lee himself, yeah. mm -hmm. who was ultimately framed um, for, for the Mountain Meadows Massacre. So there was violence, very ex explicit violence that happened after Joseph's death in association with the people who I think are associated with the Danites, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. so those violent individuals yeah. didn't stop being violent individuals just because the Danites stopped meeting as a group. If they needed to, yeah. 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 They That's to, why I think yeah. the church claims that the Danites, and maybe somebody looked this up, I think it was like five months. It was like a very short period in Missouri that I think. And so it's interesting to me that if they've made these oaths and there's still stories of coming out in, in Illinois or even like Bennett's or John D. Lee's wearing his sash in Utah, like, and these violence acts are still happening. Anyway, so maybe they didn't, they maybe they were organized formally, but the Danites were still a thing uh, out through. The oaths were, the oaths were until death, yeah. mm -hmm. full stop, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. the well, temple, I mean, and the temple covenant was to, to give your own lives if necessary for the building up and the strengthening of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Also full stop, yeah. right? Yeah. But we're also making the assumption that that oath from John C. Bennett is, is accurate. And so I would, I would again, point out yeah. that that's the only instance we have. So there, there may not be an oath, or maybe there's an oath that they take on their own, you know, that we don't know about. So I would argue, to Julia's point and to all of your points, that they came from Missouri to Illinois, and they were probably ready— to do things that they needed to do, but it wasn't as active because they weren't having the kind of uh, mob violence that they saw, obviously, in Missouri, especially early on in Nauvoo. So, you know, because they were in charge think, by that point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think Fawn Brody's probably right in the sense of it wasn't like this organized, constant thing, but they were probably there. So, you know, yes. Yeah. Well, they had a militia. A thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, exactly. It yeah. just evolved. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just wanted to look at the church's official stance on the Danites. Oh, so yeah, this is where it talks about that. So historians generally concur that Joseph Smith approved of the Danites, but that he probably was not briefed on all their plans and likely did not sanction the full range of their activities. Danites existed for only five months from June through October in 1838 and were only ever active in two counties in the Northwest Missouri. Though the existence of the Danites was short-lived, it resulted in a long-standing and much embellished myth about a secret society of Mormon vigilantes. Well, I'm sorry, but you can't say Joseph Smith approved of a group of violent vigilantes, but he didn't sanction all their actions. I'm like, yes, but he is responsible for them because he formed yeah, the group in the first place. Right. So they're, they're trying to somehow put Joseph Smith beyond responsibility for whatever it was the Danites got yeah. up to. He's 100% responsible, even if he didn't know about what they're getting up to. He's right. responsible for it because he created yeah, like them. Especially, yeah. if, especially if an oath like that existed at any point. Again, we don't know. This is from Bennett. Like, of course, this is going to carry on. Like, yeah, what they're not with these things back in the box. Like, yeah, what they're not saying there is that everyone renounced their Danite oaths yeah. after the five month period. They're certainly yeah. not saying that. And they're not mentioning that the temple ceremony had yeah. oaths of loyalty until death. So they're or gruesome deaths. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sorry, yeah. in the temple. Like, that just so even, really even oaths aside. Once you give men like this the ability to go around and enact justice in that way and you give them that kind of power, it's a bit Pandora's box-esque. You can't put these men back in a box and control them again in the same way. These, As we see with John D. Lee, it goes on throughout their lives. Yeah, the Mount Meadows Massacre is a great example. So this is the this yeah. is a clear attempt of the church to bracket and limit what they know is problematic behavior yeah. without giving all the information that would show that the effects of the Danites lived on far beyond that five month period yeah. in, in yeah. Missouri. Yeah. And it says, once God it's justifies a, that behavior, it will continue. Yeah. Right. Yeah, they're like, it's a long standing and much embellished myth. If you hear about the Danites after this point, like it's all like, anyway, yeah, they're trying to what, really control that. What they're also not mentioning is Brigham Young's blood atonement doctrine that led to the death, I'm sure, of, of several people, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and again, I. With the, I'm interested in the blood atonement because in Dan I, or in John C. Bennett's book, he alludes to Joseph Smith teaching the blood atonement. Yeah, so that would be really interesting to see. We should do it. We should Ju Julia put that on our list of uh, episodes to do. Mike and Julia, uh, John, yeah. uh, a blood atonement episode. Yeah. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so this is one thing that I pulled out just from this is just from I did a study on the Sangamo Journal just to see whether the Danites still persisted or what what, what they were doing. So in the 1840s, the Danites appeared in at least four articles of the Sangamon Journal. Most of those were in conjunction with John C. Bennett, so take that with a grain of salt. Um, but there was one article in 1846 that was submitted by William Smith, Joseph Smith's brother. And then I have the the dates of those four articles. I just think that's really interesting. But should we also, read that? Should we read that little article blurb on the left? Um, sure. Like, uh, yeah, this is, this is my eyesight's probably not going to be read. Does somebody else want to read? I can that? see it. I can see it. Okay. Uh, so the, is this the, is this the 1846, November 5th, 
um, edition or not? Do we know? I actually, I think it might be the July 1st one, but that's a good question. I should have written it down. Okay. It says, it says, so this is in, this is in Nauvoo, 1842 to 1846, somewhere between there. It says the Danites foul murder exclamation point. We copy the following from the Ka Cascala Republican. It has long been understood that committees were sent about the country from the establishment at Nauvoo, requiring the members of Joe Smith's church to pay tithes and offerings for the purpose of building the temple or fortification at that place. The commands of Joe in this particular are, we suppose, to be implicitly obeyed. In the case before us, the individual who declined the order of Joe's servants paid the penalty of the refusal. His house was robbed and himself shot dead in his field. So this is an accusation that someone who didn't tithe and obey Joseph Smith was murdered, basically. Mm -hmm. And they're and they're bringing up the Danites um, as to add credibility to the story, or because they heard that it was a Danite murder, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They probably heard that it was the Danites, and that's why they're tying it specifically to them or Joseph Smith's buddies or followers. And Mike, I saw a little bit of a shrug on your part. Uh, obviously, it could be anti-Mormon. People hate the church, and they're just yeah. trying to make false associations. Is that what you're thinking? Well, I think it's also kind of like a thing that is sensational, right? So you see that, and it's it draws attention. I'm not saying they're they're lying. I'm not saying they're doing it to to incite people. They might be, but it also when you when you start, it's like if you think about our current climate. You've got labels to define, you know, whether it's politics or religion or anything. You've got these labels, and when, once they take on, man, people just keep using that label because it's it's sensationalistic. So it could just be that because people are like, "There's this thing," and we're now going to associate it because it, it allows us to define it. You know, so I'm kind of rambling mm -hmm. a bit, but it just could be a term that yeah. people kind of think is interesting. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he's calling him Joe. Anytime they call him Joe. It's chances are they don't like the church, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, but we don't need to keep repeating that. We can, we'll let viewers and listeners decide what they believe and don't. Yeah. So can I just I wanted to point out. Go go ahead. Oh, so I'm trying to find stuff on the the Danai oath while we're talking, and I keep finding this other oath that is just not sourced, and it's interesting because it does feel similar to what John Bennett says. Do you guys want me to read it real quick? Sure. It's quick. It says. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I do covenant and agree to support the first presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in all things, right or wrong. I will faithfully guard them and report to them the acts of all men. As far as in my power lies, I will assist in executing all the decrees of the first president, patriarch, or president of the twelve, and that I will cause all who speak evil of the presidency or heads of the church to die the death of dissenters or apostates, unless they speedily confess and repent, for pestilence, persecution, and death shall follow the enemies of Zion. I will be a swift herald of salvation and messenger of peace to the saints, and I will never make known the secret purposes of this society called the destroying angel, my life being the forfeiture in a fire of burning tar and brimstone. So help me God and keep me steadfast. What's I the wonder, source, Mike? I wonder if that's from Hickman. It. Well, it's just I, a random text on the internet? Like it's, what? It's everywhere. It must come it from a book. Like Hickman. Everyone... It sounds like Bill Hickman. His his whole book, he has a book called The Destroying Angel. And okay. that's, it sounds like, I mean, I don't know for sure if that's the source, but that sounds like okay. that might be. A good place. Yeah, place I, I would love to know where it comes from. So we'll ask our viewers and listeners to do that research, and in the comments, they'll let us know, and then we'll mention yeah. it next episode. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, but Mike. With the, Julia, yeah, so what I, were you going to say? Oh, just going back to the slides. So it, I was just wanted to point out also in Utah. So at Utah, of course, Brigham Young is teaching the blood atonement, and there's a lot more violence going on, especially during the Reformation. Um, so during the Utah period, this same newspaper, the Danites were referenced 41 times between 1850 <laughs> and 1859. And and then ten times during 1860 and 1869, and so like so they're ramping up in Utah. So like the church to, for the church to say that it's they're just a myth or a like a longstanding, what it, what it was the wording again? Like if it for the church to say that it's a myth doesn't feel very honest. Uh yeah, though the existence of the Danites was short lived, it resulted in a longstanding and much embellished myth, much embellished myth yeah. about a secret society of Mormon vigilantes. You juxtapose the church calling it much embellished myth 
with all those instances that you just mentioned, yeah, 41 times in a single decade and 10 times in another decade. That's good research, Julia. Nice work. Yeah, I just, anyway, so I wanted to, so I guess I kind of wanted to push back with Brody, but like at the same time, she didn't, she just said organized. She just said we, it wasn't an organized thing, which I okay. wouldn't argue with her about that, but, but it definitely, but, I would definitely push back on the church to say that's not accurate. Yeah. Check out my, check out my interview with Barbara Brown about the Mountain Meadows massacre because, or, or check out her book with Richard Turley, because regardless of whether they use the word Danite with the Mormon Reformation and Brigham Young's violent rhetoric, there was absolutely a multi-decade cultural, you know, um, milieu of violent language and rhetoric spearheaded by Brigham Young. And well, so like, whether yeah. or not he used the word Danite is, is, uh, mass, is sort of masking the fact that if he wasn't responsible for the Mountain Meadows Massacre, I think even Turley would agree he was responsible for using language that, that encouraged and led to violence. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was just thinking the, the oath of vengeance in the temple at the time that the members covenanted to take vengeance on the people who killed Joseph. And then, Mike, as you were reading it, it made me think of the... I'm not going to get the name right. The secret society right now in the Mormon church that checks people. The what strengthening, the strengthening, yeah. strengthening oh. the church members committee. Yeah. yeah it made SCMs. me think of that, yeah. that, that the church has yeah. people now watching out for people who, I yeah. don't know, are causing problems, but yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Nemo>. <laughs> okay. So I just wanted to, this next one is just an overview of what was happening with Bennett. Okay. Um, so he's disfellowshipped in 1842 in May. And then in the same month, there's sexual allegations, which we've discussed. And then he's resigned as mayor. And then he's given his disfellowship notice. And then he's excommunicated June of 1842. And then he abruptly leaves like two, three days later. And then Joseph publicly denounces Bennett in July. And then August 8th, there's a record of him being expelled from the Nauvoo Lodge. And then one thing I thought is interesting, on August 13th, he began writing his expose and then not even a month later, like or a month later, his expose is finished. That's, That's almost as miraculous as the Book of Mormon. <laughs> yes, John. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like an angel gave him a record that he translated. <laughs> well, I mean, people will say that he's pulling out of he's pulling sources out of newspapers and things like that. But you know, you why isn't it, why isn't it the gift and power of God that that helped him write that book in, in under a month? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think Joseph took longer with his book, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> which is more miraculous, John John C. Bennett's biography or the Book of Mormon? Which is and more John miraculous. C. Bennett and John C. Bennett got to survive on his own book for two years, and Joseph, I don't think he got to live off the Book of Mormon. Did, did John C. Bennett have scribes to help him? He didn't. Which I, I think so. we've just proven that John C. Bennett's biography was more miraculous than the Book of Mormon. I sent to community tab poll. Which one's more miraculous? <laughs> yeah. well, <laughs> that's yeah. funny. Okay. Yeah. All right. That's good to know. Okay. So this is, this is a quote from his, from John C. Bennett's book that I thought was fun. If Joe Smith is not destined for the devil, all I can say is that the duties of the devil have not been clearly understood. Ooh. <laughs> that's he, savage. Writes, he writes very well. He's well, I shouldn't say well, but like he, he's very flamboyant or he's very, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Um, he's hilarious. not accurate. I will say he's not accurate, but he he does. He's very humorous. Okay. All yeah. right. That's a good quote. <laughs> oh, here's another one. Um, Nemo, do you want to read this one? This is That's just true. another fun one from his book. Okay. And now, my fellow citizens, permit me to appeal to you again and again on this most momentous subject and urge you, in the name of all that you hold dear and sacred, to spare no efforts to put down this hydra-headed monster of Mormonism before it swallows up all that is valuable to you in this life or in the next. Unite yourselves and stand not idly by, suffering a few zealous individuals to fight single-handedly to battles of humanity and religion. Written by John DeLitt. No, that wasn't you, was it, John? <laughs> that was John C. Bennett. <laughs> and Julia, what do you like about that? Well, he's just, his language is just really funny. Like he's calling it a hydra headed monster and he's like, we have to put it down. And he's being very vocal. Like Joseph was right to worry about Bennett. Um, I don't think, I don't think he needed to go as far as he did in trying to stop Bennett, but. I mean, yeah. let's, uh, so I just have to say that like, we all have our Mormon conditioning where Nauvoo was, was, was jelly beans and, and unicorns and lollipops and rainbows. <laughs> but, but. I, you know, I, I, I've tried to make this point in some of my writings. Uh, what's the difference between Warren Jeffs 
or David Koresh or Jim Jones right prior to Joseph Smith being assassinated. In other words, isn't it true that Nauvoo could have had a similar fate as Jim Jones or David Koresh or Warren Jeffs if Joseph hadn't been assassinated? Because wasn't it at a minimum that doesn't meet the criteria of a sex cult by any definition? And then if you add the abuses of power uh, and uh, and and of uh, the the political corruption and the the military um, exhibitionism, like how how is 1844 Nauvoo indistinguishable or distinguishable from the worst cults that we know of? Other than it didn't end in the in the massacre of the members, thanks weirdly to the assassination of Joseph. It's almost like the assassination of Joseph Smith spared the death of many, many Mormons. Do you guys think I'm, I'm off there? No. I mean, it, the thing is, like I always say, I wish Joseph Smith had ever been killed because I think the longer he lived, the more obvious it would have been that he was making it up. Um, on the other hand, like you said, you've got this militia building. You've got all of these tensions. And eventually, yeah, you're probably likely, if they couldn't have pulled Joseph Smith out to where they could kind of kill him on his own, you probably would have had some sort of a war or larger skirmish because of the fact that the outsiders looking in are going, this is not right. And more and more info is coming out about what Joseph Smith is doing with polygamy. And it would have ended probably a lot, a lot worse had Joseph Smith not been killed. Uh, my, my cynical brain is throwing all sorts of things out there about, you know, what's the difference between a cult and a religion that, well, in a religion, you're, first leader dies in their 30s you know you look at christianity you look at mormonism both had leaders young leaders that died in their 30s right um but i think on a more sensible point um it having joseph smith be martyred gives people something to rally around and i think what cults thrive on is a feeling of external oppression and having your leader killed in the way particularly joseph smith was killed is just going to solidify that oppression narrative and it's going to make people scared and what cults thrive on is people in the community being scared and having a strong leader to tell them that they're going to fix everything. And that's what Brigham Young was very good at. Brigham Young yeah. was, was very good at that. And so he led them, but arguably their, their um, exodus across the plains and the people that were subsequently brought to Utah, I would argue a lot of Mormons died because of that journey more yeah. than maybe would have, you know, died had Joseph Smith survived. I don't know, but you know, it, it wasn't that Mormons stopped dying for the cause. It's just they died out on the prairies rather than in a swamp, I guess. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that's, that's why Sorry. it's so interesting because what if what if Joseph Smith lives and all of a sudden in, in 1845, 18, you know, they, and all, more and more people find out about polygamy and the church kind of splits because of that. You just don't know how it's going to go. But yeah, the church survives. Mormonism survives in large part because Joseph Smith is killed. Because from a standpoint of, as we've done in 50 episodes— if you look at this stuff, it's clearly not what it claims to be. But when you have something to rally around, like Nemo said, it, it gives you that, you know, polygamy was something they rallied around. It allows you to have this, this identity to the church as opposed to to yourself. And once you, once you give your identity to something, it's hard to get it back. So yeah, it, it certainly gave it that, that extra oomph. And, uh, just a couple of real quick points there. I think that's critical, that idea of identity, because as Russell M. Nelson is now just continuing to undermine everything that made being a Mormon unique and individual, I think we're actually, that's not going to make the church easier to live and keep people. I think it could actually have an inverse effect is that more and more people leave because they kind of just float out because there's nothing holding yeah. them there. Uh, and the second thing about Nelson, about the word Mormon, that quote that you showed on there, the, hy the hydra-headed monster of Mormonism, that will definitely at some point, I'm sure, be shown as someone saying, look, the word Mormon was used to abuse us in the early days of the church. And this is why Mormonism is a horrible nickname. We have to remember that Joseph Smith used the word Mormonism and Mormon himself too, and espoused it and used it as a normal name for the church. So this is not John C. Bennett using it. Uh, th that part of the quote yeah. is not the bit where John C. Bennett's being mean to the church. That's just the common name for the church at the time. I just want to make that clear because there's so much out there of people trying to say, look, early detractors of the church use the word Mormon and Mormonism. Therefore, yeah. isn't Russell M. Nelson right to say we shouldn't use it anymore? No, because Joseph Smith himself was using it. So that's, yeah. Well, he said it meant more good. Like, he wasn't just using yeah. it. He was claiming yeah. it. <laughs> and Hinckley reaffirmed that in the 90s. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, not to get sidetracked. Yeah. I just... 
I feel passionately about that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's what I guess, I guess reflecting on this quote a tiny bit more. On the one hand, I think any of us would would feel like if if a prophet was pressuring our fourteen year old girls to marry them under penalty of eternal damnation of them and their families, we would call that a, a monster, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that is that is in, in mother daughter pairs sister pairs men being sent on missions so that Joseph could could uh, you know make advances to their wives like that all happened and and yeah. so it is it is it was a monstrous time if you care about um you know sexual predation it was uh, that alone was a monstrous time i guess the problem with this quote is is that john c bennett was involved in it he was participating in it and so he's he's a, he's a hypocrite um, because he was complicit, right? Yeah, like he helped make yep. this. He created create, the monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah he well, was he was one of the he Hydra was heads. Dr. Frankenstein. He yeah, was one of the Hydra around. heads. <laughs> yeah, he was what, one what? of the Hydra heads. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, he was right next to Joseph. His head was right next to Joseph's head. Yeah, yeah and his anyway. head got yeah. cut off, and now he's sour about it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. complicated. Yeah. Okay, great quote, Julia. Okay, so one of the biggest things um, uh, that came out of him leaving Nauvoo and writing this expose is that he gave lectures. He gave so many and in, in, in dozens of places along the East Coast. And he was promoting this book. And Joseph Smith, one thing that I thought was really interesting, Joseph Smith predicted or prophesied, however you want to see it, that whoever involved themselves with Bennett and his book would lose money. But on the contrary, Bennett was able to go two years without any other source of income from the money he earned by giving lectures and selling his book. So he... His occupation was being an ex-Mormon, I guess. So are we saying it's, it's a failed it's a failed prophecy by Joseph yes. Smith, basically? If you want to call it a prophecy, yes. It was certainly a failure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's good to know. That's good to know. <laughs> yeah. And then how Joseph reacted. So Bennett's Bennett's giving all these along the East Coast. There were so many places. In his autobiography, or excuse me, in his biography, there's just chapters and chapters of this. And then Joseph was uh, seemed afraid. To me, it looks like he's afraid. And so in late August of 1842, Joseph Smith called on many elders in Nauvoo to go on missions to rebut Bennett's lies and disabuse the public mind. More than 300 elders fanned out from Nauvoo. That's so like, I think a normal mission has, does a normal mission have 300 missionaries or 150? A couple hundred, probably 200 couple hundred. maybe. So, yeah. the, so it's like a mission. It is a whole mission that he's doing. Anyway, so he sends these elders out and they were. Days. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. And they were laden with certificates to rebut the stem statements of Bennett. So they've got their own material. The elders tried to encourage editors to insert these statements and affidavits into their newspapers. Few succeeded, but many newspapers mentioned that these anti-Bennett certificates had been published in the Mormon press. After one of Bennett's lectures of the Mormon, uh, after one it's been after one of Bennett's lectures, the Mormon elders stood up and began preaching, and afterwards baptized twelve people. I thought that was a fun story. <laughs> like, so what? So, tell us, Julia, what? So there, so in one of the meetings, and I can't remember if I referenced this one, but there was one, so one of these meetings, he's telling them, he's exposing Joseph's polygamy, he's exposing the Nauvoo City Charter, just everything else that he's talking about. And then so missionaries are sent there and they stand up and they start yelling. There's just a lot of debates that are just, they're just openly yelling at each other. And then afterwards, I guess 12 people got baptized. So yeah. that, you know, it's a mission. And there was a lot of them that, um, there was one of them, they would turn off the lights and everyone would have to leave. And then there was another one where they started they interrupted Bennett and they started speaking in tongues to try to get him to be quiet. So like, anyway, I just thought that, I just think those stories are really interesting. But. I can hear, I can hear Mormon rhetoric, ch Mormon church leader rhetoric saying, well, you know, Bennett was making money off of, you know, tearing the church down, but this is sort of like the, the equivalent back then of true crime. Like people had a fascination with Mormons because there were all these rumors of death and death oaths and, and polygamy and sexual predation. And so why wouldn't they want somebody who is an insider to come tell them what was going on there? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it makes all the sense in the world mm -hmm. that people, and I'm glad, I'm grateful for the whistleblowers that were willing to talk about what they saw, um, you know, personally. Mm -hmm. I, I just had a thought that like, we t you often say history repeats itself, right? And and it's nice to see that the church hasn't deviated from a pattern of behavior since the 1840s, where someone's out there criticizing the church, and so they actively send people out to try and drown them out and to try and 
bury their message and to try and convince people otherwise. I mean, what what are what is fair Mormon? if not the exact same thing they tried to do to John C. Bennett. What, what is the pamphlet that um, D. Michael Quinn wrote to try and take down the Tanners, if not exactly the same thing? If the church does this time and time again. Someone who was in the church discovers problems with the church, tries to tell people about those problems, and the church's MO every single time is maybe not send 300 missionaries, but certainly send some people out there to try and talk down the problem and say it's not as big a deal as it is. And they've been but also to ex, you forgot you forgot excommunicating oh, the whistleblower. The whistleblower yeah. also, yeah. yeah. M m even if they're telling the truth, Mike, what do you think? No, I, mean, I think Nemo's point is good. I think you you're going to expect that the church is going to try to rebut these. I mean, ultimately, the church is trying to to convert everyone in the world, right? So they're not going to want to have one guy going around to these lectures and being unchecked. Uh, the flip side is what you don't hear at these lectures is uh, these Mormon elders getting up and saying. Uh, yeah, we're doing polygamy and yeah, we're taking extra wives, but it's totally cool. They're just saying, you know, this guy's lying. And so that's a difference. Like it's one thing to defend yourself and to defend yourself with facts. It's another to defend yourself and leave out a lot of important details, which you still see today. Um, as Nemo said, when you look at apologetic sites where all of a sudden you read it, you're like, you're leaving out a lot of big details here that completely undermine your point. Um, so yeah, I expect the church to do that, but I also, I think you can't give them points because of the fact that they're not coming clean on what they are doing. Didn't didn't the church continue to deny the practice of polygamy until like 1855 or something like that? Yeah, it was a long time after this. Was it like another 10 years before Brigham Young and the church admitted polygamy? Mm, it was after yeah, they were in so. Utah, too. Uh, yeah, so. they were sure once, Utah. it was only once they were firmly settled in Utah and felt yeah. they were like beyond the reach of people that they were like, well, we yep. can be open about this now. So this, this, yep. this was part of a... Uh, ruse. And didn't we cover that, Mike, in one of the LDS discussions episodes about missionaries who literally, yeah. Mormon missionaries who literally were polygamists themselves going to Taylor. England, John converting Taylor. people and Future denying Prophet, yeah. that the church was practicing polygamy as polygamists, right? It's John yes. Taylor's yes. pamphlet and then, in Paris, right? Yeah. Yep. Famously. And then yeah. these women are mm -hmm. coming over, they're coming over with nothing. And they get off the boat or they get off whatever, the train, whatever. I don't know what they came on by. And then all of a sudden they have nothing and they find out, oh, no, they are doing polygamy. I, I've just been and practicing. I have to join. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can't. Julia, yeah. we did an episode on that, right? On, yeah. on With human yeah. trafficking, yeah. Was Joseph Smith yeah. the human trafficker? And mm -hmm. I think we decided and, and, to keep from, that criteria. Yeah. From that, yeah. I think it's important to mention that actually once that became known and reporters were going to Utah and reporting on what these women, the conditions they were in and whatnot, and, and once – that was reaching its way back to England, the amount of Brits going over as converts yeah. instantly began to dry up. Like the moment people yeah, found out, that, we were yeah. like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> who would think that being finding out that when you go to Utah, you're going to be handed off to a 75-year-old man as his uh, teenage or young 20s bride would be an unattractive offer? <laughs> when you didn't speak the language, right? You couldn't even speak the yeah, language. Yeah, and, and you, you have no poor, way out. Right? Yeah. There's no way out. Like the, the idea that it's yeah. not like you're driving from Salt Lake to Provo and you can be like, I'll just go back home. You have nothing. You have no family. You leave your family. A lot of cases, you leave your friends. And um, the predatorial behavior with, in, you know, we've, we've talked about that in those episodes. And that yeah. is an area where I still can't talk without getting mad because it is so horrible what they were doing. But yeah. So, yeah. So, was, so to come out here and say we're not doing it is just, that's where I, you know, I'm like, yeah, of course the church has a right to defend itself. But, they're telling everyone that Bennett's lying. Not being he honest. was not lying about polygamy. Yeah. 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 All right. That's good. Okay, so this is more on the anti-Bennett missionaries. So regardless of whether these Mormon men who were sent to watch John C. Bennett were Danites, which I thought was interesting because the some of the sources say that there were 300 Danites. Um, so that, that's the exact same number. So it just connected in my head. So whether they were Danites or not, they were sent none, nonetheless. Newspaper articles reported that the Mormons would some would sometimes show up to these lectures and debate openly with Bennett. I think I just told the story, so I kind of just went over the story. We don't have to read it. It's okay. just that these these people are coming. They're standing up and they're started. They're just interrupting him by speaking in tongues. Then they put out the lights and everyone is forced to leave. So the Mormons are trying, or the members of the church are trying really, really hard to get Bennett to to be quiet. So I mean, that's that's intimidation, right? It's mm -hmm. it's silencing. It's it's uh, intimidation. That's bad stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. let, let the guy tell his story. Don't interrupt right. him. He and He's entitled to his own story. And it was true. I mean, a lot of what he's saying was true. I Just, guess part of me, yeah, yeah. My Part of me was is like Joseph's protesting too much. Um, 
Like yeah. if, if it was all lies, just let him say lies. No one's, it's, there's going to be nothing to back it up. But Bennett wasn't saying lies. Bennett was being, to some degree he was, but it's specifically about polygamy and how Nauvoo was, was set up and things like that. That Those were honest. The church yeah. acknowledges now those things. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. That's good. Okay. So this is just something that I wanted to point out just to, just to show the expanse of this all. So before the publication of his expose and after Bennett was giving lectures to the public, exposing Joseph Smith and Mormonism, he met with newspaper editors and had as many articles published as he could. And then the following are newspapers that cover the stories of Bennett and his expose. And this is not all of them, but these are the ones that were pull, pulled out by his biographer. There's just this huge running on list of everyone who was covering that. Like for so, our for our listeners, there's at least 29, you know, newspapers, yeah, New York Times, right. Chicago Democrat, Buffalo Commercial, Illinois Register, Quincy Whig, Bostonian, Salem Observer. Like I just want to give our listeners a sense for yeah, what they're not that. seeing on yeah. on the slide. T- just a ton of newspapers. Okay, it, go ahead. Yeah, it's it's just remarkable how much Bennett how much he was being heard or spreading out yeah. this exposing Joseph. I mean, I this could, this would make sense why they, this would give credence to the idea that they wanted to kill him because how much damage did he do to the church once he was allowed to live and to go on and talk about what he experienced? Yeah. It, it had to have been incredibly damaging. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is why the church excommunicates uh, whistleblowers, right? Yeah. To, to try and discredit them and cut them off. Yeah. 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 And I know we've talked about this multiple times before, but just as a, one of his pushes in his expose was to, he wanted Joseph Smith convicted for the attempted murder of Lilburn Boggs. And he says that Bennett claims that Joseph sent Orrin Porter Rockwell to do the murder. Of course he was not murdered. It was a failed attempt. Um, but, but there he were, was shot. He was shot. He was shot. Yes. He was injured. Um, and there were reports. And I think Orrin Porter Rockwell may have even said it himself that he was in the neighborhood on the night of the attempt. And so that was just a big push that for him to, he wanted Joseph to be put away. (laughs) So, yeah. And to be fair, Boggs had issued an exterminating order against Mormons where he basically said it was okay. What for Missourians to kill Mormons? Is that right? You're, you're in Missouri, Julia. Uh, I apologize on behalf of my, my state. (laughs) Yeah. That, that is what happened. Yeah. And it wasn't just until a a couple decades or two ago that the Missouri. Which is embarrassing. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's good to that's good to know. And again, we talk about that that Hydra monster assassinations or attempted assassinations. I think that fits within the characterization of a monster, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 So there's this idea that um, his biographer pulls out that that maybe Joseph and Bennett were kind of made a reconciliation. On December 8th of 1843, Bennett returned to Nauvoo, went to Joseph Smith's general store, and paid Smith $3 for each of the 39 weeks he had boarded with his Smith family. Neither Smith nor Bennett ever made any public reference to this incident, leaving us to wonder if Bennett attempted a reconciliation with Smith. And this is from Andrew Smith, his biographer. I just thought that was really interesting that I thought it was worth putting in here is that we don't, like, maybe, because he's like, hey, I stayed at the, I think this was the Nauvoo, or the mansion house. Like, hey, I stayed, I'm trying to pay you back. And this is in 1843. So it's a couple of years after he was excommunicated. So maybe there was something in him where he was maybe tired of, I don't know. It's just an interesting Maybe he was just coming at. to flex on all the money he'd made by selling his book and doing damage to the church. He's like, maybe, I can afford to pay you and drop some money. Maybe the it's desk. the opposite of, of reconciliation. Maybe he was gloating. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> but, maybe. Yeah. That's okay. what I'd do. No, okay. <laughs> Gloat. <laughs> like, here's all the money I owe you. Yeah. Okay, so one thing, so this is just, this is his after, um, after his, his his lectures and things. So in the spring of 1844, Bennett was reportedly once again in Nauvoo among the Mormons. The Daily People's Organ reported that Bennett had formed an acquaintance with a female Mormon by which he was led into lamentable mishap and was expelled by them. So I guess he's kicked out twice. This was evidently a polite way of referring to Bennett's um, adulterous behavior. So... He still has well, like, the pattern of trying to take women. <laughs> that hasn't changed. Yeah. Why would he try and sneak? Uh, this doesn't make any sense because if he is no. as you know scared of being assassinated by Danites as he keeps making out, then why, why is he, he going back, back into like right. into the den, the lion's den? Right? Why does yeah. he keep going mm-hmm. back there? It makes no yeah. sense. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. He returned he in 1843 really and then 44. Right. Right. <laughs> well, if no, it was but, an old acquaintance. Maybe it was an attempt to to keep the boogeyman alive. 
you know, oh, from, is... from from the perspective of Joseph Smith trying to control narrative about there's this John Bennett character and he's out there and he's doing all these problems just as a way of reminding people that he still exists and that we're fighting because these cults, these groups, whatever, they all need an enemy, right? They need someone on the outside that they're fighting against. Um, so this could Yeah, be... it doesn't... If he's running That's around the around. country trashing the Mormon church in 30 newspapers, yeah, I, I would think he'd be afraid to show up in Nauvoo. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't too. know. I think... I think I the newspaper went to Salt Lake. Yeah. <laughs> I think the lecture has the lectures had started dying off in 1843. So like maybe things had come down. I don't I don't know. But yeah, it that's, doesn't make sense. That's weird. Him. That's a weird yeah. story. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so after the death of Joseph, Andrew Smith, his biographer, points out that Bennett appears to have had no influence on the events that unfolded in the Carthage jail during June of 1844. It didn't even occur to me that that would that, that would be a question in people's minds. Um, that Bennett could could have been involved in the murder. When Bennett heard about the murder of Joseph Smith, he reg- he regretted that in the heat of a, an embittered strife, he had strayed in, into a severity of expression, of which his cooler judgment did not approve. So he's apologizing for being angry is what I'm reading. Bennett maintained that at no time did he justify mob violence in dethroning Smith or urge or urge circumventing Smith by fraud. And And so far that seems um, to stand up. He just wanted to... Yeah. I go know. ahead, Julia. Well, Finish your thought, Julia, and then yeah, Nemo. Yeah, well, ahead. it seems like he wasn't, it didn't seem like Bennett was trying to be violent towards Joseph. It just seemed like he was just trying to give these lectures and sell his book. I don't think he was involved in trying to send a mob towards Joseph. Can we have that slide about the monstrous Hydra again? Sure. Because I want to have a quick look at the wording of what he said there. Um, he said... Yeah. Uh, to name all the whole sacred, to spare no spare efforts. no efforts to put down, put down yeah. this hydra-headed monster of Mormonism. Yeah, before it swallows up that. all that is valuable to you in this life put, or in the next. Isn't put, put down. down a euphemism for murder and yeah. kill? He yeah. talks about um, suffering a few zealous individuals to fight single-handedly to battles of humanity and religion. Like I'm not sure he can say, "Oh no, I didn't want anything bad to happen." Like he was, yeah, he yeah, may that's... not have appealed directly to violence, but he was v- very much urging people to do everything possible to stop Mormonism. Isn't the whole yeah. fable of the Hydra about killing it, right? Of fighting it with the yeah. sword and killing it. So it is a violent, it's a violent yeah. metaphor yeah. to invoke. And my, my immediate reaction was, yeah, just like Brigham Young didn't cause the Mountain Meadows Massacre, mm-hmm. but he certainly contributed to the rhetoric that led to the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And in the same way, John C. Yeah. Bennett absolutely contributed to the information and then the hatred of, of Joseph Smith that certainly contributed to his death, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, that's a good catch, Nemo. That's, yeah. It's not specifically calling for violence, but absolutely calling for violence. I don't, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. just it. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay, so then, then I want to talk about the succession crisis because um, Bennett plays a fair amount into the succession crisis. So Bennett claimed, so after Joseph Smith's death, we don't, there was no specific person who would be the, I don't know if you guys have done an episode on that yet, about who was the next chosen we, prophet. The succession yeah. crisis? Yeah, have you We have covered you done it a little in the transfiguration of Brigham Young, but we haven't done it like a real good in-depth oh, okay. look at it. Add it to the list. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so Bennett claimed that during his time in the first presidency, Joseph Smith gave him a sealed envelope that appointed Sidney Rigdon as the, ne- as the next prophet, with William Marks and Brigham Young as the counselors. Brigham Young and others called, a rev- called the revelation a forgery, and one newspaper claimed that the revelation was written in Bennett's handwriting. And I just wanted to point out that we don't have any revelations in Joseph Smith's handwriting. I'm pretty sure that's been that's known by historians that he, was, he always um, dictated things, and so that's just not something that we have. Hmm. Rigdon lost his leadership struggle and was excommunicated. He started a new church called the Church of Latter Day Saints. Okay. So, so yeah, he's he's yeah. <laughs> I mean, it 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 would. Sidney Rigdon claimed that he was the successor, mm-hmm. uh, and Joseph and and John C. Bennett was Joseph's right hand man at the time. So I've got no problem thinking that that claim has merit. Yeah, like we don't we haven't we don't know. Yeah. Because but I mean, it, it's it, plausible. It, it's plausible. No, it's absolutely possible. Yeah. Because yeah. mm-hmm. if, yeah, if Brigham Young's staging a power grab, he's going to say things, right? Yeah. 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 Okay, that's good to know. That's fascinating. Okay, so later, so there's another character, James String. He was um, broke off from the Mormons. 
Bennett later began write to write letters to James Strang, who also claimed to have had a letter from Joseph appointing himself, Strang, as the rightful successor. In his letters, Bennett stated that he was ready to enroll under Strang's banner and requested the same position that he had under Joseph Smith in the first presidency. Bennett became a strong supporter of Strang. Bennett advised Strang to have Joseph and Hiram's bodies exhumed and removed because it would, quote, have an astonishing effect on in congregating the people in Vore and where they were located at the time. Which I, I'm pulling that one out because I just thought it was super interesting. Like, I didn't realize, but people, I, I this last summer we went to Nauvoo and they have, they told stories that the reason they didn't tell, they didn't disclose where the bodies were buried is because even the members wanted to dig them up and take their body parts, like hair or fingers or whatever, to because they saw them as like luck charms and things like that. So I just thought that was super interesting that even uh, Bennett's pulling that out. <laughs> And the church tries to tell us that magical thinking plays no part in the early church. Like, come on, <laughs> people want Joseph's finger as a lucky rabbit's foot. Like this. Well, is, and then you have the stories pervasive. of, and then you have the stories of Alvin Smith, who they they were going to yep. exhume his body because Joseph was mm -hmm. told to take his body to go get the plates or to take him, and he had died already. So yeah, there's just a lot of. Yeah. I just thought that was an interesting story. So, I, but yeah, I, so I, I think this. Oh, keep sorry, going. Go on, Julia. Go on. No, no, no. You say. I was going to say, I think this shows Bennett's flair for the dramatic once again. And just kind of like the stones on this guy to just wander up to Strang and be like, yeah, give me the same position that I've caused <laughs> loads of trouble by having before. Like, you know, that yeah, church yeah. that I've almost single handedly undermined and caused a succession crisis in. Um, yeah. Give me the same job again, please, in your movement. Cool. That, like, right, yeah, right. pretty shameless when you yeah. think about it. Yes. Especially yeah, I thought that. He wrote in his expose that his whole objective in joining the Mormon church was to expose it. And now he's trying to join other offshoots of it, which just, it, yes, either, that... either he, e yeah, either he loves the power he had and he wants to regain that power and that feeling of importance, or he actually has some affinity for Mormonism. It probably is it just, he just seems like a bad dude, but yeah, it just cracks me up how he contradicts himself by his well actions done. quite a bit. Yeah. yeah, I get you know I get it. You know, when somebody like, for example, becomes a, a part of Mormon Stories podcast or becomes part of the Mormon Stories interactions with the world, that you know they really like the exposure, they really like the notoriety and the fame, and and just like uh, in those instances that I've seen. People like uh, Oliver Cowdery or Martin Harris or certainly the Whitmers. What is what are they going to do in their lives after they leave the Mormon movement that's ever going to come anywhere close to the notoriety, the fame, the significance of being attached to or associated with the movement? And so it makes sense that John C. Bennett wants the interest in his uh, stories about Mormonism dies down. He's irrelevant again. And so sometimes people will do anything that they have to to stay relevant. And and so in that sense, it makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. So you're saying, John, if your podcast becomes irrelevant, all of a sudden you'll go join another religion, leave it, and then start a new podcast. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna try and be a co-host of Nemo the Mormon. I'm gonna try oh. and be a co-host for Nemo the Mormon podcast. Is what's gonna okay. happen. We're not gonna see Catholic stories anytime soon. Maybe. No. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Who knows? If I feel too desperate uh, and unneeded. <laughs> So I do think it's interesting that uh, he is trying to join Strang's church and not um, Rigdon's church, even though he's the one that carried the letter to Rigdon saying yep, that he was the right? next prophet. So it's kind yeah, of confusing. Yeah. Although um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think for Bennett, it's about the legitimacy of the church so much as it is just about being like John said, kind of at the top of a power structure. Like, yeah. I don't think yep. he's going, Oh, well I'm going to go for Rigdon because Rigdon's got the legit claim to be Joseph's successor. He's kind of just like, well, who's actually going to let me in? And then I'll go. Right. There. Right. I think yeah. that's what, what the concern was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in oh, Mike, do you want to read this one? Yeah, um, in 1846, while in the Strang Church and while Strang was away on business, one of the members of the High Council, Aaron Smith, charged Bennett with teaching and striving to put into practice false doctrine regarding polygamy and concubinage. The High Council expelled Bennett from the church, but Bennett ignored them, and when Strang returned, he said that the meeting held without him was not legitimate and that the testimonies against Bennett was a lot of hearsay trash. Eventually, James Strang excommunicated Bennett from the church. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> this guy. Man. This guy. Yeah, so he's just, he's 
repeating the same behavior and, and having the same results as as in the Mormon church. So, he's, yeah. He's like yeah. a seedy guy. He's turned up. He's like, guys, I can get you lots more women. And they've gone, nope, yep. we've seen this go wrong no. before. Off you go, Bennett. We're not having any of it. Uh, like, well, kudos oh, to Strang. I don't know. Kudos to Strang for yeah. not, is for not uh, succumbing, I guess. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know if his religion maintained not having polygamy. I kind of. That's true. Uh, Somebody should look that yeah, up because I, I thought know. his I thought his group accepted polygamy later, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Maybe they called it spiritual <laughs> wifery. Sure. Oh yeah. Or maybe they called it the new and everlasting covenant. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> and then got rid of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is another part that plays into the homosexuality. Um, during his time with the String at Church, Bennett made became close with a Dr. Pierce B. Fagan. Bennett made every excuse to see him, sometimes temporarily leaving his wife in another state due to financial reasons. Bennett and Fagan later started an office together in Iowa. Andrew F. Smith said, Bennett was clearly attracted to Fagan, and this attraction might well have been of a passionate nature, at least on Bennett's part. Was so that, that a was legit really picture of Fagan? I think that's no. AI. That's AI. If I've ever <laughs> I, seen AI, that's AI. Yeah, I'm not trying to deceive people. I was just having a reference. Yeah, that Calm is down. AI. Calm down, Nemo. I mean, that's Calm a down. good-looking guy in a cravat. Like, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's good. That's cool, Julia. All right. Sorry, Julia, you were saying something before I lowered the tone. Oh, no, it's just another reference of him being bisexual. Yeah. So, yeah. It makes me, it makes all the other ones kind of hold a little bit more weight. But even his biographer is like, yeah. And he had a lot of letters that he was sending to this doctor and he was really insistent on seeing him. But anyway. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So this one I thought was really funny. So this is Brigham Young. He's the next prophet. He's, so he's the mouthpiece for God. In 1850, Brigham Young claimed that Bennett had died a gruesome death, and one of the saints called it a fulfillment of one of Joseph Smith's prophecies. Despite the prophet's statement, Bennett was alive and well and would live for another 15 years. So either Brigham Young was lying or he was misinformed. Yeah, I, but you'd think that if you're talking to God that you wouldn't be, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you would know. You would know. Uh, by my own yeah. voice and the voice of my servants, it is the same. Uh, also, they reference they reference that Joseph prophesied that would Bennett would die a gruesome death. I haven't seen that prophecy anywhere, but that is really interesting if he did say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. All right. Okay, so we're just wrapping up here. So um, earlier, so um, I, I titled this one "Catch Up Poultry and Death." Earlier in the fall of 1843, Bennett joined the joined the Hinkleite Church, founded by ex ex Mormon George Hinkle. Bennett published his own recipes for ketchup and used it in pill form as medicine, which obviously didn't do anything. Bennett wrote, <laughs> Bennett wrote a poultry book, and you can see that. You can just go to archive.org and, and check out his poultry book um, uh, in March of 1850 and crossbred other chickens to create the Plymouth Rockfowl, which I thought was super interesting. It's a very gorgeous chicken. He also was the first to exhibit and public- publicize the Brahma chickens. He also bred several game birds for cockfighting. So that's interesting. <laughs> Yeah. He died. Yeah. He died in early August of 1865, and is buried next to his wife in the Polk C- City Cemetery in Iowa. His tombstone is one of the largest in the cemetery, and you can Google that. It's just this huge, massive tombstone. Like I'm not oh, sure why, wow. but I get the town loved him. At the end, when he totally disassociated from Mormonism, he started like doing all these things, and he brought the communities together. And I think I think when he was trying to show off his chickens, they they started. They're like, oh, well, actually, we love this idea. He wanted to be the center of attention to show his chickens off. But the whole city loved the idea that it's still a thing that runs on today that they created around these chickens. So anyway, I just thought that was wow. interesting. I, I, I think, to be honest, if he had mixed that ketchup with mayonnaise until it was a nice kind of like pink color and then put it in pill form. <laughs> then he I would think, be a prophet. Then that that would have medicinal properties up the wazoo, I would, I would argue. Isn't that right? All right, Nemo, fry thumbs sauce? up or thumbs down fry sauce, Nemo. Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up? Thumbs it's up? It's weird. It's so weird, but yeah. Like all right, it's... Mike. Go, all right, put your thumbs up, Julia. Thumbs up or thumbs down on fries. Mike says no. Why? We have a dissenting I've, I've, I've... voice. Let's excommunicate this huge... guy. Get rid of him. I'm not a huge of... mayo fan. I'm not a huge mayo fan, so, you know, that's, oh, no, that's man, not you're, great. Fair. All right. You're, you're, you're excom- we just excommunicated Mike. <laughs> Mike Mike's, Mike's out of here. He's no longer part of LDS discussions. Sorry, Mike. See you later. You're gone. No, I'm just kidding. Mike, <laughs> welcome back. Mike, we'll bring you back into fel- full fellowship, Mike. <laughs> if you repent. Will you repent? I've never, you know what? I'm not a huge male <laughs> fan, so I don't think I, don't think I can. On that. Uh, he's, he's, 
He's just holding the line. He's just he's not yep. repenting. He's not refusing to take the ketchup sacrament every <laughs> I'm now gonna go on I've just scheduled a lecture tour against Mayo, so <laughs> <laughs> Prep the missionaries, John. So I think right, I had one I think I had one final quote, I think. I'm gonna start oh, speaking sorry. in tongues. As soon as you say anything, Mike, I'm gonna start speaking in tongues. <laughs> Okay, so to most Mormons, this is a quote from Andrew F. Smith. To most Mormons, Bennett's activities in Nauvoo, his expose of Joseph Smith, and his subsequent activities in Bore represent the deepest moral depravity. It is no wonder Bennett is the man Mormons love to hate. And what the only problem I have with that is modern day Mormons have never heard of the guy. And that's yeah. how we started this episode. Literally, none of us heard of John C. Bennett until well into our 30s or 40s, right? Except mm -hmm. Nemo's not 30 yet. <laughs> yeah, I'm not 30 yet. <laughs> <laughs> but none of us were taught about John C. Bennett in all our years of church education, correct? True, yeah. I know about I Porter taught. Rockwell. I knew more about Porter Rockwell than I did. Absolutely, the, the assassin. But it's yeah. just because the church didn't want us to know about John C. Bennett. So they hid his existence from all of us, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Which which means something. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to say about that, Julia? No, I just I, I really liked it. But he's the biographer, so he of course he the sources he's pulling from are um, he is seeing clearly that Mormons hate him, even though uh, the the lay members or whatever don't know anything about him. So all right. So hopefully this was informative to everyone. What a great three part series, Julia. Mike, do you get yeah. do you give Julia the thumbs up for her John C. Bennett series? One hundred percent. Yeah. Nemo, yeah. Thumbs up to Julia. Nice job, Julia. Thanks. That was very good. Now, do any of you have episodes you've either prepared or want to prepare just to give people a preview of what might be coming? Julia, I know we've had you work on a couple of possible things. Yeah, so I have one that's almost ready. It's the problematic witnesses of the gold plates. I know that, Mike, you you have a mixed feelings about that because it's like we shouldn't even be doing this episode, which is we're totally not going to invite no, Mike. Mike yeah. is, just won't be invited to that episode. He's, yeah, too much of a Debbie you know, Downer. He's a, no, it, oh my goodness, he's a buzzkill. Yeah, he's a buzzkill. Well, Mike's a buzzkill. Yeah, the witnesses. <laughs> well, we we talked about it before. The witnesses don't they matter? Of course, and they're 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 used as an evidence for the Book of Mormon, so they matter. But at the same time, like you have so much stuff to tell you that this isn't what it claims to be that uh, people having an experience. I mean, at that point you could go to any, you're already poisoning the well, Mike, she hasn't even done the presentation. You're already poisoning <laughs> yeah. the well. Hey, well I, Mike, where's I, your objectivity? I yeah. Let her, you know let her, a, let her present the yeah. case, Mike, let her present the case. Well, I know it's important to some people. There's people like I'm making it TikToks is. right now. People no, are getting really mad. They're like, no, they never denied. And like, yeah, I so know. And while it's, it's not important, important because, it is yeah. important. Right. It's important. I, Graham, it's, it's Palmer, that, um, Graham Palmer thinks it was important, and he's to be respected, it, right? It is because you, uh, to Julia's point, I can't tell how many people have said, I the witnesses never denied oh, yeah. their statement. They saw it, which means it was real. So, of course, it's important. I just feel like the people that are saying that typically haven't gotten into the details of all of the issues with the Book of Mormon. Um, but, yes, it is important. It is worth going over. I didn't do it when I did the overview topics because at the time – I didn't think it really was conclusive. So it's like, you know, it's a choose your own adventure kind of topic. So to me, that's why I didn't do it. It's not that it's not important. It's just that it, to me, there's so many other things. It's kind of like we talked about in the last episode. There's so many things that show it's not what it claims to be that the witnesses kind of fall into that. Well, and I know Julia will cover a lot of the, the things that I think you can look at right away to go. This doesn't quite add up, but um, yeah, no, it's a Wait, good can thing. I ask, do you think there were actual topic. plates? Do you think there were actual think, plates or do you think? I, I agree with um, Dan Vogel and I'm, I know other people have said it, that there had to have been some sort of prop set that they, you know, wrapped in cloth because there's too many accounts about that. But I do not believe there were real plates with reformed Egyptian for sure. You know, I think I think, I think what yeah. we really, what I'd love to get into as like, maybe you could add this, Julia, sorry to give you more work, but the church seems to have added a new witness out of nowhere, the Mary Whitmer in the barn. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Do you think that's out of nowhere? Same, well, yeah, like to me, that's out of nowhere. Like, oh, I grew up hearing of, that story. Yeah, so I did. Yeah, I heard that one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'd, I'd never heard that until I saw this article that the church chose to entitle that <laughs> one night in the barn is a moment she'll never forget or something like that. Yeah, that was a which, really big yeah. um, <laughs> oversight. And then the ex Mormon yeah. world went mental and then they changed it back to something. Yeah, did they really change it? They oh, yeah, they changed it. I didn't know that. 
Yeah. It's like she was another because witness of the gold plates, is what yeah. it says now. Oh. The SCMC is watching, so hello <laughs> um, <laughs> to you on whatever floor of church office building you work on. I hope you're well. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so, Mike, are you wanting to develop any more episodes, or are you on retirement for a little bit? Uh, well, no, I'm definitely open to it. I don't have anything. Like, I, uh, you know, haven't done anything on the website in, like, a year and a half. So, at some point, I really want to put a PDF together of all of the topics, which I started and have not finished um, but yeah, we have a list of stuff that I think would be interesting. I would love to do, um, you know, we talked about the witnesses, but Julie is doing that, which I'm glad because, um, as you all know, my feelings on the witnesses, uh, but th there's definitely different elements that I think would be really fun to, to go over that we haven't touched on or stuff that we kind of like, we were talking about some other episode and something came up we're like, oh, that'd be a good thing to cover. So there are, we, we have a list somewhere that we were working with. Yeah. I think Maven's made the list. I think she's got a running she adds to it. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll rely on Julia until you're ready to step back up to the plate, Mike. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, Julia's doing a good job, so I might just keep sitting back here. Well, right. I love you guys' takes. You guys have really good, like, I don't know, like having different perspectives is really helpful. All right. Well, you do great work, Julia. So thanks for this series, and we're looking forward to the next Thank one. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Yeah, and please subscribe to Nemo the Mormon podcast on YouTube. Please subscribe to Mormon Stories. Uh, on Facebook, YouTube, t Instagram, and uh, TikTok. And check out LDSDiscussions.com for the essays. And Julia, you've got a great TikTok and Instagram channel as well called Analyzing Mormonism, yeah. which is also... You know, I told you my dad, who's 89 years old, he loves your TikTok channel. What? I didn't and, know that. And he is a faithful Mormon. What? Well, man. I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. My dad, faithful Mormon, 89 years old, loves your TikTok channel. <laughs> and that put this into perspective, sense. Julia. You know how lovely and charming I am? John Lynn's dad, like, I'm, I'm convinced doesn't like me because I've been on an episode with him and oh. he did not have any time for me. No, he loves you. Oh. He, my dad loves everyone. And he's, he's not your typical Mormon. He is a very progressive, kind, Jesus-focused Mormon. He's not a truth claims only true church kind of Mormon. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I've never I'm felt just saying any... it's high praise, Julia. It's high praise. Oh, okay. That is high praise. <laughs> All right. Because you're because you're so charming and it doesn't make yeah, sense why he would like you. And it doesn't work on him apparently. <laughs> he just doesn't like He doesn't get your your humor's over his head, Nemo. It's just too sophisticated. And what's your <laughs> I don't know if I can ask this. Can what's your dad's name? John? David, David Joel David. Delin. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll have to give him a shout out or something. <laughs> All right. That's cool. I'll send it. I'll send it to him. He'll be thrilled. Okay. <laughs> All right, Mike, you're a legend. Thanks for joining us today. You're the best. Thanks everybody. Nemo, thanks for everything you do. And Julia, you're also the best. We're, we're a good team. Let's keep this going. Yeah. All right. Teamwork. All right. And thanks everyone for joining us today on uh, Mormon Stories Podcast, LDS Discussions Edition. Please comment. Please let us know what you like and don't like. Please uh, tell us of all our historical inaccuracies. The best place to do that is in the comments on YouTube. We read every comment. So if we need to do important corrections, we will. Uh, but if you have ideas for topics, if you have feedback or thoughts, praise or criticism, we'd love to hear it again on YouTube. Uh, thanks to the donors that support Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation. We pay these three amazing individuals and me from your donations. So if you want to see this continue, please do support us financially. Uh, thanks for the support. Be good to each other. Be kind to each other. And we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast and LDS Discussions. Take care, everybody.